Uh, my name is uh, Jacob Sherman with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. Today is April 7, 2010. I'm visiting with Dan and Janice Bigby for the second time here in the OSU Library and we're going to discuss the Ethiopian Project. This interview is part of the O-State Stories Project. T today we're primarily going to interview Janice Bigby, but uh, whenever her, her husband feels the need to chime in, he can. I'm sure he will at some point. <laughs> so, all right, I'm going to first ask you, uh, you grew up in Temple, Oklahoma. Yes. Uh, can you describe for me your childhood? And uh, I'm really interested, you're Comanche, right? Right. Can you uh, detail that lineage for me, too, as well? Well, let's see. First of all, I was born in the Fort Sill Indian Hospital that the United States provided for Native people. I think Mom and Dad were born there, too. And Daddy, let's see, I was born to Charlotte Tahawa, that's her maiden name, and Robert Hevaw Atchvit. And we lived, he had a farm, four miles west of Temple, Oklahoma, which is in Cotton County. Um, Mom and Daddy worked hard. Daddy had cattle and grew wheat for cash crops. Otherwise, and then Mama had her, her uh, poultry stock so that we'd have eggs to eat, chickens to eat, and then she could sell them for money. And whenever Daddy needed an extra hand, that was my mother. I've, I've gone with them to fix fences and whatever. So, and we had a great big garden. We grew everything you could think of, and most of it was canned for our winter feed. And we'd pick uh, uh, red um, plums, sand plums. They make the best jelly. And she'd can those, and so we have, and we had potatoes. I can tell you a story about the potatoes. Okay. They were, we had half a basement. The other half was where we stored potatoes after they were harvested. So I'm the youngest and I was the smallest. They pick up two boards off the porch and hold it up and I'd slip down. I was the potato retriever. And as that, those boards went down and got dark down there, they'd say, look out for snakes. <laughs> anyway, um, but I had an uh, idyllic childhood. We ran and played and swam and uh, I had 15 cousins and they'd come spend the summer. And so it was just a big gang of us going swimming and hunting and playing games. And um, we did have chores though. My job was to take my little basket out and gather firewood because mm -hmm. our uh, wood stove was the heat for the house. And um, my brother and I had to feed the hogs, which I <laughs> hated. We got, I think it's Purina hog chow. Okay. It was dry, and then you have to mix it with water and haul it down to the pigs. And they wouldn't wait for us to pour it into the trough. They'd come up, we had poured all over them and all over us. <laughs> and then on Saturday night, or Saturday evening, I guess, we'd go to town, and uh, I would sell, I gathered eggs, that was my mm -hmm. pen money. I'd sell my eggs, and my brother did the milking of the cows, and he sold his cream. So that was our money, our uh, allowance, I guess. And uh, we also went, uh, were members of Brown Church. And uh, it was up, the hill from us. And the strange thing was, it was three acres were donated to build the Christian church by our very traditional uh, medicine man, mm -hmm. who was not a Christian. Mm -hmm. But we had a very nice uh, brick building up there. And uh, my grandmother lived with us, and she became a Christian. And she would walk up that hill, maybe four miles, mm -hmm. in her old you know, shawl and blanket thing, 
no matter how cold it was, that's, that was her penance or something to uh, uh, this, uh, this Savior, I guess. And one day the missionary saw her coming and he stopped to give her a ride. She said, oh no, no, she was going to walk. Mm. She lived to be 103 and her picture is hanging in that little brown church, uh, a rural church. And um, I, I was in third grade and I said, I have three grandmothers and everybody laughed. I thought, I didn't see the joke. Well, in the Indian tradition, you don't have aunts and uncles and cousins. You have brothers and sisters. And when Dan married me, I said, you have also married my four sisters and those kids are your kids. And our kids were their kids also. So Dan became the father rather than an uncle or... Um, but the three grandmothers, my father's mother died at childbirth. So he had three, she had three sisters and they were my grandmothers. And uh, so I didn't see any joking when I told him we had three, I had three grandmothers. But it's just a closer association and all my cousins were uh, either brothers or sisters. So we grew up very close. How did your uh, family acquire the land? It was an, uh, initially allotted to my mother when they passed the um, bill in 1924, I think it was, um, they were going to break up the in Indian lands, break up our reservation, and give every living person at that time 160 acres. A section of land. Yep. And uh, even infants, every, any living being at that time got 160 acres. So that's how we uh, acquired the land. And uh, traditionally, we were hunters and gatherers, but they wanted us to settle down on our 160 acres and, and farm. Mom and Dad got into it pretty well, but we had some Comanches that just would not conform. Mm -hmm. They were not farmers. They would never be farmers. And so a lot of them sold their land. So we lost a lot of Comanche land that way. Did the, did the dispersal of the Comanche lands, did, that occurred later than the eastern tribes in the state, right? Mm hmm I'm trying to think of the act that did that. Is it the Dawes Act? The Dawes Act, uh, the Dawes act uh, was the act that stated that the, the five civilized tribes, I hate to civilize whatever, you know, mm -hmm, it's such a mm -hmm. bad term. You know what I mean, but... Yeah. The, but the, that land was going to be dispersed and allotted for mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. and spread to allotments. Yes. Um, some of the tribes only got 60 acres. And I don't know how we ended up getting 160, but um, I guess we were in the dry western, terra, uh, western Oklahoma, so we needed mm -hmm. that much land. But uh, I like to stress that a Comanche child is never alone. You have all your brothers and sisters and fathers and uncles and mm -hmm. whatever. So you always had somebody to take care of you. Now, do you, you still go down that way ever visit? Yes, I have a farm down there. I inherited that farm from my daddy. The land we lived on was my mother's allotment. So I still have a farm in uh, southwest uh, of uh, Fort Sill or Lawton, Oklahoma, okay. and uh, it's a nice place to camp. There's a nice sandy beach, and uh, it's a nice place. Mm -hmm. And my father grew up on that farm, so it means an awful lot to me just just the fact that he grew up there. And what you probably grew wheat down there, or cotton, or we had wheat and the cattle on mama's farm on daddy's farm it was too far away to move the farm implements yeah. so that was the least to a farmer in the area 
And I also lease probably to the same family. There's a family of, um, what's his name? Can I think of my, anyway, my lease man has brothers who also leases Indian land around there. Mm -hmm. For those who just, Comanches, who just weren't not gonna farm. Yes. Did, so you you grew up working on the farm. Did you ever did you ever drive a tractor or any of that? I drove a tractor for one day. And what was that? My Your daddy, first and only tractor. My first and only day of tra driving the tractor. I went out there and went round and round in circles in the hot sun for the day. The next day I couldn't move. And daddy came in. He says, "Let's go." Uh, working and I said I am not going to get on another tractor as long as I live but otherwise you know we kids were called upon to do some farm labor mm -hmm. um, since we're from Cotton County which says that our county grew cotton uh, we would start school early in August for a couple of weeks and then we would close all the schools in the county for three weeks and that was the time of the harvest we were supposed to go out and, and pick the mm -hmm. cotton and I picked some cotton, and Dan has also picked the cotton. So I like I say these are my cotton picking hands. <laughs> but that was a yearly thing. Cotton was very important to the economy. That's it. Now is cotton died down there, or it's not as profitable for us. Most of the Cotton County doesn't grow cotton. It's out west, southwest mm -hmm. Oklahoma, and Hollis and. Yes. And they... Um, they tap into the Ogala Aquifer. There's also a lake at, at what's the name of that? Altus Lake has mm. been dammed and that they use that water for irrigation as well. And for Altus, where the Air Force Base is, yes. that's their uh, supply this, of water. This cotton is a highly intensive crop to grow. Yes. Very uh, labor intensive. So you had chickens, right? And eggs and hogs. Hogs. Cattle at all or no? Cattle. And uh, we didn't have deep freezes at that time, so we'd have three or four families would come in with us to butcher a cow, mm -hmm. and they divided among the families. And I know there were three of us: the Wooksies, um, Bruce Toma, and my family would butcher a, a hog together and share the meat that way. Uh, when our house was built, it's a nice bungalow um, with the kitchen, bathrooms, and three bedrooms, and half a basement. And uh, we had electricity and running water mm -hmm. when it was first built. And then a tornado hit and took the windmill, which, the, which, which generated the uh, electricity for us to have lights and to have running water. So after that, we had an outhouse and we hauled water. Did you uh, participate in the 4-H uh, activities growing up? No, I didn't. I don't know why, um, but I don't know that 4-H was very active in Cotton County. Might have been, but I didn't okay. participate. And I did have a horse. Daddy bought me a horse. And so I would ride the horse whenever possible. And the Walters would have a rodeo. And would take my horse and ride up there because they let people who would ride in to the grand entry, they let them in for free. So I got to be in the parade and I got to go into the uh, rodeo for free. But I loved my horse. We just got along real well. Now, when you went into town, was that Temple or Walters or? My mother and daddy, well, I'm going to tell you about Walters, Oklahoma. It's racist. Okay. They had a law that a black man or any black person had to leave town by sundown. There was a sundown down. Yes. And the, it wasn't uh, vocalized, but they were prejudiced against Indians as well. And mom and daddy just didn't want to uh, shop in Walters. Temple was very good to us. They appreciated everybody's money. And uh, we'd go down to Wichita Falls, Texas once a month and 
get a big load of groceries, so we didn't really depend on the local market for that. So you went to school in Temple? I went to school in Temple. I uh, went there 12 years. So it was a K through 12 mm -hmm. school? Well, it was first grade through okay. uh, high school. Uh, I had to kind of cheat though. Dan and I married in 50 and I didn't graduate to 52. And I went to uh, Fort Benning with Dan and went to school in Columbus, Georgia. Mm -hmm. So I had my grades transferred back to Temple so I could graduate with my class. Married a young one there. <laughs> so, and, so was I. Yes. <laughs> but and it was a small school, a small town, small school, and you that as far as I'm concerned, uh, my school was like my family. And when we have reunions, it's like a family reunion because there was only twenty of us. I think half boys. 15 boys and 15 girls or something like that but uh, they thought a lot of me and I didn't realize it till after I'd left mm. school what was was it primarily white students primary Indian students that went there or was it it was a public school okay mostly Caucasians but there were I don't know a handful of Comanches that lived down there I don't know if you know LaDonna Harris Mm. She is uh, the CEO of uh, Americans for Indian Opportunity. She was my sister's best friend, and she went to Temple High School. And uh, some of my other brothers and sisters also went to Temple. Were you guys treated differently by the whites or no? Not at school, not in Temple. Okay. I started driving my dad's car when I was 13, and the sheriff would call my dad. He says, now Robert, you know she's not old enough to drive, and you stop it. So daddy came in, he said, Janice, you know what, cool it. That's all he had to say, cool it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you about the uh, Janice. It's an uncommon name. How did uh, your parents pick that? I don't know. And I laughingly said I was number 10 baby and they'd run out of names. <laughs> I have no idea where she got Janice. But when I moved to Lincoln, there's a Sioux family who are Janice. And I also had a college classmate who was a Janice. Mm. And a friend of ours had daughter Janice, so they Saw several Janices after okay. I went left home. I was curious about that. Dan? Eh, that was common. <laughs> yeah, everybody's <laughs> named Dan. Um, so, you, do you remember, you grew up, uh, you were born in 33, right? 34. 34? Mm -hmm. So you remember very little about the Depression? Um, right. Uh, we were coming out of the Depression, I think, when I was born. However, Mama and Daddy had planted a large orchard, and that was all ruined because of the drought in the 30s. The only two trees that survived were pear trees, and they had the nastiest, awful, gritty fruit. <laughs> it wasn't fit to eat, and those two guys survived, and peaches and apples and all that didn't. Did your uh, farm ever have any work done by a soil conservationist at all, or do you remember? Uh, I think the BIA had things like that. I know Daddy would go to the um, livestock um, meetings, and I don't know what they learned there. And the uh, they had uh, county agents. What do you call the women that go out? Home extension agents. Yes home extension agent would come to our house and would visit ser uh, several Indian homes to, you know, help women along for food preparation mm -hmm. and balanced diet and all that stuff. Okay. Um, now, you, so you basically came of age when the Second World War was happening. Correct. I was in first grade. First grade? 
Do you remember much about that time period or no? I remember when uh, Pearl Harbor was uh, bombed. Uh, we had an old battery uh, powered uh, radio. Yeah, so high. Mm -hmm. And the battery behind it was bigger than the than the uh, radio, but uh, Daddy would listen to the news at five o'clock, and I hated it because he was always going shh 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 shh. We had to be quiet while he listened to the news, and I hated the news. But anyway, we kept up with things like that. We realized that that we were at war, and uh, Daddy went to work for the Boeing airport. Boeing airplane plant in Wichita, Kansas. So, you know, it the war created jobs for some. And so we lived in Wichita, Kansas for a couple of years while Daddy uh, built uh, B-17s and the uh, B-29 bombers. Well, weren't uh, Wilbur and Melford in the Army? In yes, the my military? older brothers were in the Army as well. In fact, one of them was at Pearl Harbor and was wounded oh, wow. at Pearl Harbor. Yeah. But he didn't want to talk about it. That's all we know. You know, he just never um, let us know how he was wounded or anything. Was he in the Navy then, or was he in the no? Army? He was in the Army. Okay. He ran away from school when he was 16. Went to Fort Sill, which is right there yes. at home, and did his combat. Or they accepted him, and I guess shipped him off to Hawaii at some date. My other brother was in the Army until he uh, retired. Mm. He was an Army cook. And uh, he loved to cook, and it was good for him, and got to move around some, and ended up being at Fort Sill, like I say, he's 30 miles away, and uh, until he retired. And my before Daddy went to Boeing, we still lived in Cotton County, and he and my older sister worked on uh, at Fort Sill, okay. they worked at the Air, uh, Army base. I'm not sure what Daddy did, but my sister worked in the uh, warehouse, and uh, and sh so she could get things that were rationed. We got Hershey bars, <laughs> we'd get a, a case, 24 case of um, uh, Dr. Pepper and Coca-Cola. <laughs> so that was great. We love that. Now, what did he do uh, for Boeing? Did he was he, he on the line or? Yeah, he was on the line, and he was they they his group put on the back, the tail oh. area. Yeah. Do you remember much about that? Him sharing stories about that, or? No, it was just a job. Um, one thing about uh, remembering the Second World War. Uh, shoes and lots of things were rationed. You, you couldn't get chocolate, you couldn't get uh, margarine, you couldn't get uh, Crisco. And I guess we got um, uh, ration, ration tickets for gasoline and sugar and flour and it was um, it was scaled to your family. If you had a large family, you got more. Mm -hmm. Anyway, my sister was working in Lawton at the uh, Fort Sill, and uh, they would the girls that worked there would go to lunch in town sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so she came home and she said, uh, one store had some shoes which were not on the didn't require a ration ticket. So. Mama got me out of school, and I went up to work with my sister until lunchtime. We went down to the store to buy me some shoes that didn't require a ration ticket, and they didn't have my size. They were pretty red things. I wanted it so badly, but anyway, putting my size, so it's kind of a lost day for me. And when, so. So your father went up to work for Boeing. Mm -hmm. Did it make more than the farm? Did he make more money-wise, or? Um, well, you can't make money on a 160 acres farm. You need to be bigger than that. You need more implements. You need whatever. 
And so daddy always supplemented his, um, the income from the farm. He and my uncle went to New Mexico one winter, lived in tents and cut wood for the military. So that was quite a, quite a deal. I just, I just find that time period fascinating. So and next, you, when did you come back to Oklahoma after the war ended? Um, I'm trying to think. I went to set fourth and fifth grade there. I think we had moved home. That would be like 45, 46, or? Yeah, 45. I think we had already moved home. And uh, we have uh, the Indian Fair in Anadarko, Oklahoma, mm. every, uh, uh, annually. And we were at Anadarko when the war ended. And so I remember being in the car and Daddy driving around town honking their horn. And, you know, there was a whole yes. lot of cars running around honking their horns at the end of the war. Did you guys participate in the Indian Fair? We camped there because it was actually uh, like family reunion. All of our relatives would be there. And it was a, it was a fun time for us. It was in the summer. And there was a lot of visiting and some of my relatives I wouldn't see except at the fair. Because it was a good time. Because nowadays that, that's pretty large, isn't it? Um, the fair part's gone. It's more just a powwow. Anyway. Yes. But they used to bring produce, and you know, just like a regular state fair. Oh. But that went by the wayside. Was that separate? I was just wondering, is it separate than the... Oklahoma State Fair? Or? Mm -hmm. It was totally an Indian fair. It was uh, administrated and organized and whatever by a committee of Indian men mm. from the three tribes, Cabo, Comanche, and Apache. And was it open to all other tribes? Yeah. Yeah, it was. We had other tribes there, but, you know, very few. It wasn't mm. like being surrounded by all of us Comanches. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they felt uh, uneasy. <laughs> and so you went to Temple High School. Mm -hmm. What's your mascot? Tigers. tigers. Temple Tigers. Red and white Temple Tigers. And so the big rival was Walters. And yes. So that's where you met this gentleman sitting next to me. I was aware of Dan Bigby when I was a little girl because uh, the the drugstore where he worked, they also it was also the bus station, and Mama's relatives would come down and stay and stay and stay, and when she got tired of that, she'd take him to Walters and put him on a bus. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, Dan Bigby was a boxer. Oh, he didn't tell me this. He bo boxed at 112. He was the first one up to box. And uh, he was in college, and he came down, and we had a local uh, boxing match. And he came down to box one of the Temple Boys, who was like my brother, I swear. He was just a brother to me. He got in the ring with Dan, and Dan went like that, walked him in the stomach, and Doug fell down, and that was the end of that. Well, everyone was mad at Dan Bigby. We were going to get him. He beat up on Doug. So that's when I really remember Dan. They went into a hangout, teen hangout called Joe Laux, and uh, he walked into the Joe Laux, and he came in with another boxer, so we backed off. We didn't go in. We didn't go in there and get Dan for beating up on Doug. But after that, and my daddy followed sports. He loved football, and he followed the teams. You know, they win the county and then the district, and then go up to mm -hmm. state. And he followed those winners in uh, football and boxing. And he was very interested in the boxers because most they were mostly Comanche boys. My uncle had a barn and he fixed it up as a gym. And Dan and the boxers 
from Walters would go up there and train. So when Dan went to Cameron College, uh, he was also on the boxing team. And he was first up. Yeah. And he'd go and, and beat the guy up and then go and dress and then come up sit with us while we watched the rest of the people. And that went on for three or four days at a time, you know, uh, gradually eliminating people. But that, and then that winter, uh, we were, Temple and Walters were playing, and my cousin Kent was helping Dan with the chain. And at the halftime, I walked over to have a cup of coffee. And Dan bought me a cup of coffee. And then we dated every day, every night that August. And uh, one, two, and he, he went to uh, National Guard uh, once a week, every Tuesday, mm -hmm. for a couple hours. And he'd gone to, to his training. Then he came home real late, knocked at the door. He said, I want to talk to you. So I got in the car and uh, he asked me to marry him because the 45th had been activated and they were being shipped off, uh, ultimately for Korea. And I said, yes. And the next day he called me and he said, you know what we talked about last night? I said, yes. He said, forget it. <laughs> you did. Well, that's your story. <laughs> now, we did elope. His, his mother, I don't know that she was against Indians. Maybe she didn't have very high regard for them. But uh, she did not receive me well. So uh, Dan devised this plan. Uh oh. <laughs> he told his mother he had to use her car. It was 35 Chevrolet. He had to use her car. He and his best buddy were going to drive up to Oklahoma City to his friend's parents. And they were going to stay the weekend. So that freed up the car. Well, Dan did that. He went to Oklahoma City. And then he came back and got me, and then we went on our journey to a loaf. It just didn't make sense. And he stopped along the way. There's a Chickasha, Ardmore, I mean, Marlowe, Duncan, and then you can go west mm -hmm. to Cotton County. He stopped in Marlowe and bought me this ring, mm -hmm. my wedding ring. I had to borrow, borrow the money to do that. And we were going to keep it a secret. We were married and he was going to go away and all that. We were going to keep it a secret. But the secret got out. The secret lasted one day. I had a niece who was uh, um, very ill at the Indian Hospital. And uh, she was running a very high fever, like 104 and 105. And they couldn't get it down. They would pack that child in, in ice. It still didn't work. So anyway, my mother was staying in Lawton at a uh, cousin's house, because they were gone somewhere. Anyway, we had the whole house. And so I got home, and I went with my mother to Lawton. We went out to the Indian Hospital to see about my niece. And after the visiting hours were over, we drove up to Marie Red Elk's house, and there was Dan's mother's car. And I thought, oh no, oh no. Anyway, he was there, and we walked in, told Mama that we were married. And uh, then we told his mother the next day, and she was very, very unhappy. I don't know whether she's more happy, unhappy because Dan was young and, and, and ran away and got married or that he married a Comanche girl. Mm. And she never would admit it. But I think that was part of it because she was from Walters. Mm -hmm. Was your uh, family accepting? Daddy was off with my brother-in-law and my brother in South Dakota or North Dakota 
uh, with the combine. They, if someone had a combine and whatever trucks and trailer houses and whatever, they'd start in Texas and follow the go north. Yep, follow the wheat harvest. Mm -hmm. And so they were in one of the Dakotas when we got married. So um, we moved into a. It was actually a motel. But it was in town and it was all run down. I don't think anyone used it as a motel. Uh, but anyway, Dan and I were able to rent one of the rooms for $50, $20 a week. So we moved in there. His, his income was $20 a week. So we, <laughs> we had to go to his mo mother's and grandmother's to eat. And uh, about two weeks later after we got married and moved into the motel, um, I was walking south on Main Street of Walters, and Daddy was coming north. And we passed in the middle of the street, and he said, I hear you're married. And I said, yes. And he kept walking, and I kept walking. So I really don't know what he felt. He was very stoic and not very talkative. Her parents were a lot more accepting of our marriage than my mother was. <laughs> did time heal those wounds? Over time, did to a certain extent. <laughs> she she gave me. A, she was the typical mother-in-law. I mean, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> now, what did you do when he was overseas during the Korean conflict? Okay, the uh, 45th was sent to Camp Polk. Army, it was an army base in Louisiana that had been closed down after the Second World War. Mm -hmm. So it was in disrepair and overgrown and you know, it had been closed um, and abandoned for years. So the 45th went down there and they had to clean up the place. They'd get a barracks and they'd get it all fixed up. Then they'd put them in a, another barracks they clean that up. So uh, anyway, it was Camp Pope and we there. I understand it's Fort Pope now. Mm -hmm. um, That's, I believe it's still on operation. Yeah. And uh, my brother-in-law, who went on the wheat harvest, had a teeny weeny little trailer house, smaller than this room. And Dan talked him into letting us use that, and we'd pay, make the payments on it, which were $47 a month. So Daddy hauled that thing down to De Ritter, uh, Louisiana, and uh, I went to school in De Ritter one year. I think it was must have been a sophomore. Right after we married, anyway, uh, we moved in down there, and I went to school down there, which was quite an experience. It was, I would say, it's substandard from first to. Uh, high school through high school, but I was only there for that year, and in March of that year, um, they uh, sent Dan to Japan, all the 45th, all the people at Fort uh, Pope were sent to uh, Japan to further their training before they went into to Korea. And uh, while I was there, at, uh, while he was at Camp Pope, he could only come home Tuesday night to midnight and uh, weekend Saturday afternoon to Sunday afternoon. So we didn't see each other very much. But you you didn't go to Japan? Right? No, no. You stayed in? Daddy came down and hooked up that trailer house and took me home. And I went back to Temple High School. That. And how long was he overseas? Eight months. Eight months. How often would he write you? He wrote every day. <laughs> <laughs> I think he wrote every day, <laughs> saying how much he missed us. And uh, then he came home. Do you, that, do you huh? still have those letters? I probably do up in the attic. Oh, I was just curious. Oh yeah, I, I keep everything. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what were you saying? 
Um, he came back uh, eight months later, and um, he was flying in from Seattle. And we got news that he was coming in on the 8 o'clock plane to Oklahoma City Airport. And so his mother and I went up, and we slept in the car because she was afraid uh, of uh, maybe too much fog. We couldn't get up to the airport to get him. So we slept in the car that night. And 8 o'clock, this plane came in, and everyone, you know, we stood there waiting. Everyone got off the plane. No Dan. So we went back and waited and waited for the next flight from Seattle. And uh, he did come in on the next flight. And then from there, we went to Camp Fort, Fort Benning. Mm -hmm. He was stationed at Fort Benning. And um, I don't know, remember what month or what year, but uh, our daughter was born in Fort Benning Hospital. And we had a, a bigger trailer uh, <laughs> to live in while we were down in Fort Benning. You finished high school there, right? I did. I went to school in Columbus, Ohio, uh, Columbus Georgia. Yes. <laughs> I finished there and then transferred my credits back to uh, Temple, so I could graduate with all my roommate, or classmates. Did you spend summers uh, at Benny? Yes, I think when we first got there and got into that trailer, uh, it was it was summertime, and it's hot and humid, and I almost died. It yeah, was, I was, it was miserable. I was going to ask, I always hear uh, stories about First summers at Benning, or <laughs> believe them. Yes. <laughs> so after after Dan got out of the well, Dan was to be discharged, and so Mom mm -hmm. and Daddy came and got us. We sold the trailer house. Mom and Daddy came and got my oldest daughter Evelyn and I, and we drove back from Georgia back to Oklahoma. And in a few weeks after Dan did all the paperwork or whatever it is to get uh, uh, discharged from the Army, uh, I guess we stayed with your with, uh, your grandmother? Yeah. Anyway, we stayed in Walters for a little while after coming back from Benny. And Dan looked for a job and there just didn't seem to be any. And so one day he says, I'm going up to Stillwater. I said, fine. He said, well, why don't you go with me? I said, fine. We got up here and where the First National Bank is on the corner, there was a hotel there. We checked into the hotel and um, we looked for an apartment. All this time, I had no idea why we were in Stillwater. I didn't know OSU was here. I just knew he wanted to go to Stillwater. I thought, okay. So, so we came, we found a very, very nice apartment and a very beautiful uh, landlady who loved children. She and Evelyn got along very well, so we lucked out there. And uh, Dan went to school here and got his VA and his M your master's, both here. What were your uh, thoughts of Stillwater? Initial response? It was a lovely little town. Very, very nice, and we moved here because we it was a good little town when we were here, and we thought we'd like it here, and it's tripled in size since we've been here. It's not the nice little town anymore. It's getting to be a 50,000 population city. Where was your first apartment then, here in Stillwater? It was on Hester. Hester? 502 Hester, just north of the traffic light there. Okay, I know where they are. Okay. Is, uh, did you work during that time period while he was in school? I worked uh, a little uh, because his mother and I decided we were going to buy him a suit for Christmas. And so I worked that fall at TGNY, which is about where the hideaway is now. It was mm -hmm. a variety store. I worked there for two or three months and got enough to pay for half a dance suit and his mother came through with the other half. 
you were four years then up in Stillwater at that time period? We were here about five years. Five years. We left in 57 and to, to go to Michigan State. Did you have any more children at that time period? We had Dan Jr. Dan here, Jr.? He was born here in Stillwater. Where was he born? Here in Stillwater Medical Center, or Med uh, Stillwater Hospital. What else? What else uh, about Stillwater that you can recall from that time period? Well, aside from having a wonderful uh, landlady, uh, we joined the First Methodist Church. That was our home church, and we got involved with the Wesley Foundation, and did a lot of things where uh, we went to Sunday school, and then we'd have social things together. And they were all young people going to college all starving to death together. It was great. <laughs> we were all poor together. <laughs> and we babysat for each other and maybe have Sunday dinner together. And one year, one of our couples got a basket that was given out at Christmas time. Ham and I don't know what all. So they invited all of us over so we got to eat whatever that was in that basket. It was great. Mm -hmm. So that created a bond the Wesleyan Foundation was your social? Yes. And we still have those friends that we, we visit. Mm -hmm. So there was a, a, a nice time for us. I think uh, one maybe the nicest mm -hmm. that I had because we had so many friends. We were all on the same level, struggling along and mm -hmm. having babies and all that. Do you uh, remember much about campus, or did you spend time on campus at all? Uh, the campus is over there where the, or the poultry farm was there by the, what is it, food tech building? Mm -hmm. An old rundown shack. <laughs> but they had classes in there. So I wanted to know something about what Dan was doing. So I did um, a, um, audit a uh, poultry science course, 101, with uh, Cecil. Uh, Roberts. 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 And uh, so that was great. <laughs> that I could sit in on college. Uh, and he, uh, uh, Dr. Roberts was just really nice. Mm -hmm. Really nice. He liked us and understood and whatever. Anyway, that was fun. Finding out what Dan was doing. Yeah. Did you ever figure out what he was doing? Um, I knew he worked a lot. He made 25 cents an hour when he worked on the poultry farm. And eggs were 25, the cracked eggs were 25 cents a dozen. So we ate a lot of eggs when we were in Stillwater. But I liked it, we could walk up here to mm -hmm. campus. And, um, we have some good pictures of, at Theta Palm with, the, with our daughter. Mm -hmm. And I just have fond memories of Stillwater. Where would uh, you take your family, would you go for take your family for like family outings or how would you entertain the family? Yeah, we'd come up to campus and walk around mostly. We'd go to church, have lunch, and then maybe walk around uh, campus on Sunday afternoons. But all of our social whatever was you know tied in with the poultry uh, department and, and things that they had for um, socializing. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were included in the faculty, all the faculty things that they had. So they were part of our family too. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course our, our church home and our Sunday school class. So we had a good bunch of people we liked to be with and who accepted us readily. I would go out to dinners or? <sighs> I think we were too poor. I don't remember going out to dinner in Stillwater. I was just trying to build like establishments from that era. No, it was just mm. just graduate students uh, going to each other's homes mm. and that type of thing. Or the church would have something. But I don't remember ever going out to eat at that time. Well, we would go to the Union cafeteria for Sunday dinner on occasion. But that was a very... Really? Yeah. Okay. The The... Cafeteria was in, in the old building in the lower level, and then they had uh, some steps or 
uh, kind of like a stadium staircase up above it to the ground level. And one student ran off into that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the right. parking lot was behind the union. And uh, anyway, he went bumping down those <laughs> stairs. Ouch. <laughs> we were also here for the panty raid in the 50s. Mm -hmm. And we were here when Holly Selassie came. And uh, like I say, his, he looked to me like a, you know, someone from the Middle East mm -hmm. had that, those features. But I knew he was here, and uh, I didn't know what his business was, but I, I, I was aware of him being uh, visiting on campus. Did you, uh, you go into any sporting events? We went to, yes, football and, and basketball, because you know, they have uh, discount tickets for students, mm -hmm. so we could afford those. Oh, what else? Yeah. Did you guys own a radio at your apartment? Mm hmm What was the shows that you would regularly listen to during the 50s there? I remember the morning show, uh, Let's Pretend. And that was uh, sponsored by like Ivory Soap or something like that. I don't remember listening to the radio in the evening, though. No. I just remember while I was in the kitchen working around, mm -hmm. we'd listen to the radio. But mostly what came over KSPI. KSPI? Yeah. And that was the radio station in town at the time. See, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Did you ever bring home uh, chickens, or was there a, did you get discount? after processed chickens or for meat? Yeah, every time that, that we slaughtered uh, uh, poultry uh, in conjunction with a research project and so forth, uh, the products were sold uh, and we kind of had first dibs. dibs on it sort of thing. And, and yeah, that would be at a discount price. What about, did you purchase milk also from the... No. no. We, <laughs> all right, when we first moved into Hester Street, we were upstairs, okay. apartment. And we got um, milk from a local company. And he would come into the house and put the, ref the milk in the refrigerator. In those days, they could do things like that. Mm -hmm. He'd just come and holler, milk man, put the milk in the refrigerator. Well, Dan was home sick with the flu one day, and he heard, Milkman, and he sat straight up in bed, and he says, Who was that? <laughs> yeah, that was my, my first encounter with the milkman. <laughs> What about uh, butchered meat? Did the campus sell that too? I don't think uh, so. Yeah, they did, I don't remember. But, but we really didn't get involved in that very much. Okay. I don't even remember yeah, where we used was, to shop. Oh, there was a Safeway here where the AT&T building is on the corner of Main and Six. All right. Yeah, yeah. that building has that kind of dome-shaped top. That was a Safeway, and that's where we shop. Much different than uh, having it to grow it yourself. <laughs> well, we ate a lot better on the farm than we did in Stillwater as students. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But Mom and Dad would help us out. Well, Dan's mother um, would help us out, and so would my Mom and Dad. In fact, Daddy bought us a, a little TV before we left Stillwater. Mm. Do you, so you had two kids in Stillwater, or, mm -hmm. so three total here? We had just Dan and Evelyn. Okay. Evelyn came with us and Dan came to us in 56, I think it was. And by that time you were up in Michigan? We, Danny was crawling when we uh, went to Michigan. 
and uh, we stopped the first night in Eureka Springs. It started raining on us here. It rained all the way and to Eureka Springs and to into the night. It just didn't stop raining. We had everything we owned in that smallest U-Haul, mm -hmm. the big, you know, the smallest one you could get. Because we didn't have much, that TV and uh, Evelyn's tricycle, I guess, and a baby bed. Uh, anyway, the next day we got up and we drove and drove and drove. We hit some friends in Ames, Iowa. Okay. Uh, he was going to school there. Uh, Guilford Eikenberry uh, was in school at, is at uh, Iowa State. Yes. And we were going to stop in Iowa, and we came in to Iowa from the west. I don't know what highway that is. And, um, but I, I got so tired of corn. Once we got north of Missouri and the sun came up, you couldn't see anything because corn was, <laughs> as they say, as high as an elephant's eye. I told Dan, I am so tired of corn. Anyway, we stopped in Ames, Iowa and visited with our friends. And then from there we went on to uh, Michigan. And uh, we were about halfway through Michigan. And I said, you know, I, I smell corn. It smells like corn cooking. And it gets sniffing. Well, I didn't know that we were at Battle Creek, Michigan, uh, where all the cornflakes come from. That's right. <laughs> Home but you could just smell it as soon as you hit Michigan. <laughs> and uh, Michigan was a new experience too. It was the different, uh, I don't know, the people were different and our situation was different. Um, it wasn't bad, you know, it wasn't a negative, it was mm -hmm. just different. And uh, so Dan was working on his uh, PhD up there. How'd you like the winners up there? They didn't bother me because I didn't have to get out. I didn't work and I didn't go to school. And, uh, but it was pretty rugged. We'd go to the Sears store and uh, buy things. And you'd drive along and you'd see an a empty parking place. And you'd pass it by and go looking around for another parking place. Finally give up and park in that place and you'd fall in the hole. That's why people weren't, weren't parking there. <laughs> the ice was about this thick, and then okay. under that was about that much water. So you just kind of fell into this hole if you wanted to go shopping. And then in the morning, we could open our curtains and look out our window, and there were all the students and workers out there pushing each other. They had to get the first guy out before the second yes. guy in, so they were all out there pushing each other out of the ice and the snow. And that was different. Ever see that much snow before? Never. The first snow I ever saw I was in sixth grade. And a few little flakes came down and we were on the south side of the building, all windows in the sixth grade. We all jumped up screaming and yelling and looked out and the minute they hit the ground they were gone. So Michigan they kind of stick. <laughs> oh yeah. It starts snowing, I guess, around Thanksgiving or before. And you never saw the ground until yeah. Easter. I know how that is. <laughs> I'm from Wisconsin. <laughs> now, is there any more uh, background information prior to your Ethiopian experience that you would like to share? Well, we got to Michigan and we had two bedrooms and we had two more sons. So the back bedroom was the where the kids slept. We had a trundle bed and a baby bed and Evelyn got to sleep on top. And um, like Dan said, he came down to Kansas City to that poultry, mm -hmm. whatever it was, poultry convention, conference. Mm -hmm. And he came in and he said, uh, put his suitcase down and said, how would you like to go to Ethiopia? I said, fine, where is it? So from there, Bill Abbott came to see us. Uh, I think they kind of visited with Dan and me a little bit, and I guess they accepted us because he came back and he said, we'd like to offer you this position in Ethiopia. 
and uh, Dan said, well, um, yeah, we, we would go, but uh, I need to tell you that uh, Janice is pregnant. And Bill didn't think that it would make a difference. He said, that's fine. So uh, he, uh, he hired Dan and uh, through letters, we got all of the instructions about uh, getting our shots and, and uh, getting ready to go. And uh, we had air freight, certain pounds, and a certain pounds of uh, sea freight that we could ship over. And uh, our instructions were given to us. We had to get shots and visas and passports and whatever. And that was all done through the mail. Mm -hmm. Well, we had to have yellow fever shots. And they have they come in one vial and they have to use it up or have to have a lot of people before they'll break the vial and start giving people uh, yellow fever shots. So the family next door were on their way to Hawaii. So we went with them and we went out to Detroit and to get our yellow fever shots. Yeah. And uh, the nurse came in and she said, has anyone had smallpox recently? And there was our middle son. He just had smallpox. And the cutoff was three weeks ago. Did anyone have uh, chicken pox? And it was two weeks that he had his, two weeks ago. So the rest of us got our shots. And uh, I guess we were staying with my mom and dad because after we got the shots and went back to uh, to Walters and Temple to get make pre preparations to go, we still had to give Walter his yellow fever shot. And of course, we knew everybody. We knew the doctors and everything. So we went up to Walters to the doctor, made arrangements for him to get his yellow fever shot. While we were up at the church, and all my nieces and nephews were there, little ones, big ones, halfway size. Anyway. When I went to take Walter to get his shot, they all piled in. So I take them all with me, and uh, Walter gets his shot, and the doctor fills out the form. And uh, I go to the post office, and uh, what was the Kane guy, his name? Jimmy. Jimmy Kane. We knew him from the church, so Jimmy Kane was a uh, postmaster, and I mailed the letter. We got in the car and went back to the church. And my mother was very sympathetic to Walter. Oh, you poor little thing. I bet your arm hurts. He says, no, Robert got the shot. <laughs> so I threw him in the car and it didn't take anyone else this time. Threw him in the car, went back to the doctor, same thing, shot, fell off the papers, but I had already mailed the other form. So I went to the post office and I said, I need to have that letter back. And the guy behind the, behind the counter says, you may not have it. It belongs to the federal government now. I said, oh, gee whiz, what am I going to do? And just about that time, uh, Jimmy Kane. Jimmy Kane walked in and I said, oh, Jimmy, would you hand me that envelope? He picks it up and gives it to me. <laughs> so I had to break it open and, and uh, get the paperwork done and get it mailed off. You just tampered with federal property. I did. <laughs> and, and Jimmy Kane helped me. <laughs> well, we had to get, uh, if I may, uh, we had to get uh, fingerprinted and this was in Michigan yes and so we all went down to the police station to uh, uh, get fingerprinted and because the Robert kids had was just a, a little tight mm -hmm. and uh, so we were standing at the sergeant's desk in the front of the police station and uh, Robert was so young, they had to stand him up on a uh, stool or something or another to get him up high enough so that they could get his fingerprints on the card properly. And 
So they were standing there doing the fingerprinting on him and an officer walks in with a fellow that was obviously quite inebriated and the guy walked in and he saw <laughs> Robert standing up there and the police officer putting fingerprints and he looked at it and he said, my God, what's he done? <laughs> I've forgotten that one. <laughs> but, but, you know, he was only, what, two the, years two old or years. less? Uh, yeah, I'm about three. Yeah. <laughs> I had forgotten about the fingerprint thing. Uh, another, I guess another problem was, Danny was born with what they called a lazy eye. It was turned in. So, one of the best surgeons in the country did his eyes and he went through the operation and then we went to Oklahoma to wait out for our way up for uh, getting ready to go to Ethiopia and uh, he wanted to see Danny before we left for Ethiopia so Dan and Dan Jr. and Dan went to Michigan to see the doctor and the rest of us went on another flight through Kansas City, no, through St. Louis, and anyway, we got to New York City. And I had no information. I didn't know where we were staying. I didn't know anything. And I thought, if Dan and Dan Jr. don't get here, I guess we'll just be in the airport. Mm -hmm. Luckily, everything worked out, and the flight came in, and Dan uh, called the hotel where we were staying. And um, anyway, it was the first time we'd ever flown, so it was quite an experience for us. Mm -hmm. And they gave, and they, a TWA sent us. Uh, each child had their flight bag, which was nice. And uh, we, they sent Dan a little note asking him to order our dinner. It had steak and mushrooms and all, everything. But the, the project sent us the first class. Wow. So we got to New York and there were just the Bigbies up there in first class. <laughs> and we had like seven stewards and stewardess to take care of us. So. My goodness, they really took care of us and the kids. Anything the kids wanted, they got. But there was a problem. Um, they kept serving drinks. And people kept ordering more drinks. And they were not going to serve dinner until everyone was liberated or got all the drinks they wanted. And I think Dan finally hopped up and said, the kids are hungry. We need to feed them. So, but we had a very nice dinner finally. After dinner, they said, pull your little shade down on the window. I wondered why, but we did. It was dark, and they started the movie. Well, by the time we got to Paris, it was daylight, and we wouldn't have been able to, to or it would have interfered with the movie. Mm -hmm. So they came in, brought us some warm uh, washcloths, and we washed our hands, and they brought us coffee and a little uh, and a roll. We ate that. And uh, after Paris, we flew to, uh, we were going to Italy, and we couldn't land for two hours because they were having an a air show. So we just went around and around. And they served us lunch from Paris to Italy. And it was like eggs and a lamb chop. Wow. And Wish I'm, we'd get that nowadays. I mean. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> but I looked out the window, and while I'm eating my eggs and chops, there was a Matterhorn sticking up out of the clouds. Oh, wow. So we got to Italy and had to go round and round until I got through with the air show. We finally landed and got our uh, connection to Greece. So we spent a couple of nights in, in Greece. And uh, the kids were just fabulous travelers. You know, they just went along with everything. So we got to Greece and we uh, 
landed on the landed in Athens, and we got on a bus to take us into town. Mm -hmm. And it was a local bus. Everyone wasn't just passengers; it was just everyone. Mm -hmm. And so I sat in the back with a goat. Went into Athens. <laughs> we were scattered all over the bus. And uh, when did the taxi pick us up? Oh, the bus took us to the uh, airline office. Okay. So Dan hired a taxi to take all of us and our luggage to the Grand Breton Hotel, the best in Athens. And he said, Grand Breton, the guy said, oh yeah, yeah, throws our suitcases in there. He goes around Constitution Square and comes down and there's the hotel, straight across from the <laughs> airline <laughs> office. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, and then we had a lot nice accommodations, and it was uh, evening time, and we went to bed. About three o'clock in the morning, I couldn't sleep. I just could not sleep mm -hmm. anymore. I got up, went to the bathroom because that's on, you know light wouldn't bother the other kids. And pretty soon here came Dan. He says, "I just can't sleep." And then Evelyn came in. She couldn't sleep either. Well, it was a change in time. Yes. Okay. That, that would have been in the middle of the afternoon for us. Anyway, we went down to dinner. And I don't know if you use the word hoity-toity anymore. Okay. But we went down to the dining room, and the maitre d' saw us and these five kids, and he wanted to faint. <laughs> he was very reluctant about this. And uh, he, he let us in and gave us a nice big table. And the food didn't come till about midnight or 11 o'clock. But fortunately, they had little bitty um, breadsticks, or the kids would have torn that place apart. <laughs> but they kept refilling the little <laughs> vase that held the uh, breadsticks till we finally got to order. And there wasn't much of an order. You could get a plate of sweet, sweet breads, mm -hmm. mixed grill, mixed grill, and Chris, I didn't, I didn't get excited about that. I don't remember what I had, but it wasn't all that good to be such a great big grand hotel. But when we walked in, all the people looked at up, up, and you could just hear the yeah. intake of breath. Here's these people with five kids. <laughs> So the next night we arranged for a babysitter, or the, hosp uh, the hotel arranged for a babysitter for us. So we walked down the square and around and, and went to a restaurant. Mm -hmm. And Dan ordered steak and it came with pasta. Mm -hmm. It just broke his heart. He said, can't they just give you steak? No, you can't just get steak. They're going to cook it up and put pasta on it. <laughs> then we went over to Constitution Square had sat down, and at the lower part of the Constitution Square, there's all tables and chairs, and there's a restaurant across the street, and they would serve people sitting out there mm -hmm. in the open. And so we sat there and drank lemonade and watched the car accidents. There's no traffic light or anything, people were just <laughs> buzzing around Constitution Square. And then there were just streets coming down into the square. And occasionally there'd be a, a fender bender, and everyone would, was uh, uh, witnesses. They'd all rush down and they'd <laughs> fuss around and uh, say, no, it was his fault, no, it was the other guy's fault, and on and on. And then they finally settled it and they'd drive off. No police involved. <laughs> this happened several times. Anyway, we thought it was funny. And Dan had made arrangements for a car and an uh, English-speaking guide. And uh, he went to the uh, concierge and said, you know, we ordered this car. I don't see it. 
Dan would go out look for the car, and this little nice, beautiful little Greek lady with a hat would come in, and she'd go out, and Dan would come back, and then he'd go back. <laughs> that was our guide, and yeah. Dan was running up and down trying to find her. So we had a guide. Um, her daddy had the car, and she interpreted. And um, one place, well, of course, we had to do the Parthenon. Yes. We went up there, and there's a little temple to the side of that, which is Nike's. Uh, Temple. She's the goddess of war. And uh, we didn't have a guide or anything. We just kind of wandered around all over up there. It was gorgeous. Just really uh -huh. spectacular. And um, and then we went to Mars Hill. I don't remember what else we did. Anyway, Dan Jr. was this little guy and he worried about that building. He kept saying, why did they tear it up? Who <laughs> tore it down? Why did they do that? Because <laughs> as I understand it, it was in better shape until the First World War mm -hmm. and the Ottoman Turks. Someone had uh, stored their ammunition in that building and, mm -hmm. and, that's, and it got blown up from that. Oh, and then we went, checked out the hospital the next day, or the hotel the next day. Uh, <laughs> Just about. Yeah. Anyway, the hotel, and um, we had to check out by 11, so we gathered the kids up and went out to the airport by, you know, checked out by 11, and our plane wasn't going to leave till evening. So the kids went swimming in the Mediterranean. Mm. There's a beach just right across from the airport. So when we got on the plane, I was carrying this soggy bag of, of swimming suits to get on the plane. <laughs> that was a nice experience. And Robert, the three-year-old, and that little Greek boy, he was about three years old, they just took off like they were lifetime buddies. Mm -hmm. And when we got on the plane, Robert says, I can count in Greek. <laughs> 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 That's about the only words he knew. And from uh, Athens, we flew to, was it Cairo? Yeah. yeah, we landed in Cairo, and but it was during the uh, Israeli uh, oh. Arab conflict, mm. and they wouldn't let us off the plane except someone who was destined for Cairo. The rest of us had to sit in the plane. Dan said there were armed guards out around the plane. Mm -hmm. From there, we flew to Asmara, and that's in Eritrea. And we got out of the plane, and my first impression of Ethiopia, you could smell the wok spices and the eucalyptus. I mean, the whole country. Mm. That was the smell of Ethiopia. The sun? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. How did you explain to your children where you were going and why? What did you tell them? We did not tell them, apparently. We got to Ethiopia. We spent several days in Addis Ababa getting our groceries and things. Then we were flown to Diradawa. We stayed there two months. Danny and the kids were commuted with their dad up the mountain to Alamaya. Then we moved on to Alamaya because they had staff housing. Maybe a year later, we were sitting there eating supper or dinner, and Dan Jr. says, Oh, I turned to Dan and I said, My gosh, when I said yes, when you asked me, I said, I never, never un imagined that we would be sitting here in Ethiopia. No. Dan Jr.'s fork dropped. He says, You mean we're not in Michigan? <laughs> That was really weird. <laughs> Driving, going halfway around the world and living. And the atmosphere was different. You know, the little town mm -hmm. of Girdawa, that uh, horse, uh, horse drawn uh, buggies, 
and uh, the camels would come in out of the desert with loads of wood for the hotels and restaurants and what have you. Mm -hmm. But you know, the whole thing, everything around him was different. The streets weren't paved, and at night the hyenas would hoop, and then the dogs would start barking, and um, there was a movie house next to us. We could sit on our roof and see the movie. Oh. Couldn't hear it, but you could see the movie. I mean, just everything was nothing like Michigan. Michigan. <laughs> I could just see that. <laughs> yes. He demanded why. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but every time that we flew a long distance, we flew at night and over an ocean. So he couldn't see. So he yeah, couldn't we see. left Greece in it. He didn't really see himself going anywhere. Mm. I know what Walter did when they told us to cut, shut the shades. Well, Walter the Middleton opened his shade and he said, we're not moving. Because <laughs> it was just dark yes, and yes. no, yeah. no uh, yeah. feeling of movement. We're not moving. <laughs> you go to 30,000 feet and you're looking down yeah. at the ocean. There's, there's nothing there. <laughs> nothing, nothing, there. nothing there. And you're just alone in the world right there. Yeah. How did uh, you entertain the kids on those flights. Those are long flights. Eh? They're very long flights, but they each had their uh, flat bag. And apparently they had packed whatever was meaningful or something to do. Just never heard a thing from the kids. They were just terrific oh, wow. travelers. Okay, so you land, you get settled in uh, Dirodawa, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What was that town like at that time? Well, it was. Oh, I don't want to use the word primitive, but it certainly wasn't modern. Mm -hmm. uh, we lived in the upstairs apartment, uh, and it was American rented, and there were two apartments, one upstairs and one downstairs. And uh, the, uh, the, the project was paying for it. And uh, we lived upstairs, and the architect for Jima and Alamaya lived, could not, for some reason they were told they could not live on campus. So they lived downtown all the time and people passing through would use the upstairs. And uh, one thing I liked, early in the morning, the women would come in and they carried everything on their head, mm -hmm. big baskets. baskets of tomatoes or cabbage or whatever, fresh produce. And they had this little sing song. You know, Madame, I have tomatoes, I have gomen, I have whatever. Uh, to me, that was just, you know, an awake, it was a song, sing song thing that I enjoyed. But there were these little horse drawn carts uh, moving around. There was a lot of activity. I didn't know who was doing what or why they had to have so many horse-drawn carts, but, and like I said, the uh, street wasn't paved, and uh, we'd have to buy our groceries and everything, our, our produce locally. And, but coming into Ethiopia, or coming into Addis Ababa, they made us stay there with a couple for two or three days. And one of the reasons for that was we had to go to the commissary. We could use the American commissary uh, to buy our groceries, you know, canned goods and stuff we were familiar with. And we could order it, but they would not close, they would not send it down on the train until the box car was full. Mm -hmm. Because when they got full, they put a lock on it and it wouldn't get unlocked until Dr. Jared Alwood. And uh, so we spent a day, or I guess a couple of days there, and I just getting acclimated and going to the commissary and what have you. Then we flew on down to Deridawa, mm -hmm. and I don't know, it was, we were down in Deridawa for, I think, almost two months. Seemed like it. A couple of weeks. And our groceries still hadn't arrived. But you could buy a local flour, and uh, Ethiopia had a, uh, 
sugar plantation, you could get one G sugar and uh, go to the market and buy uh, Israeli, Australian, or in European canned goods. Okay. And they were good. The Israelis had a white peach that was just excellent. But we couldn't get uh, like apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. We had an orange tree in the yard. They're big, ugly things, like more like grapefruit. And they were so acid. Oh, the yeah. kids tried to make orange juice with it, and you could not get enough sugar in there. It was horrible. So they were just great big things. They dropped to the to the yard. And in Ethiopia, you don't have a police force. The city and state don't have a police force. You have to hire your own uh, zibanya. Protection. He was the guard, and your house was built with a solid wall, not as high as this, maybe six or seven feet, and then had broken glass on the top of that to, for protection. And your zibanya is supposed to go around and keep you safe during the night. You were and it was different, of course. Mm -hmm. And every day, the zibanya would go out and sweep the yard. There was no grass whatsoever. <laughs> it had these big old thorn trees, and the thorns were the thorns were dropping all the time. So he'd have to go out there and sweep up, sweep the yard, because it's so dry down there. They don't have any earthworms, so that nothing can grow down there. Mm -hmm. I would point out that this is all in Deirdre, not okay. up on the campus. How far was the campus from ah. Deirdre? Forty-five kilometers. So about twenty miles then. What's uh, that equivalent to? No more like thirty. Okay. It was all downhill, just you know, mm. switch back. Um, but the other campus people from Jimma. That was way on the other side the, yeah, of um, That was down in the southwest part of the country. Okay. We were kind of east central. All right. we east, like going back out to sea. We'd go to uh, Addis and then go to Jimma. Okay. There's no roads going straight through. But it's quite a trip mm -hmm. down there. Um, I was just trying to get a sense of geography. Mm -hmm. Well, it was if you drove to Addis Ababa, it was 13 hours to go 500 miles. No road, mm. and the dust was just like um, talcum powder. Real fine, and it was just stick. I don't know about sticking it. You were just covered in s um, and dust. It would would. Be and some of the women would try to keep their hair clean, and they tried. Uh, scarves and that didn't work and some people said well you put a, uh, a swimming bathing cap on well mm -hmm. I was not about to put a bathing <laughs> cap on to go to Addis so I just but I just got dirty we would check into the hotel of course and get cleaned up but that was always an exciting trip there was always something different with that um, we were at 6,500 feet if you go down the mountain and before you get to Derrida, or you would rear, uh, go off to the side and go to Astor to Ferry. Yeah. And that was the last village before you hit the uh, desert. And sometimes Astor to Ferry would have uh, gas, but you never knew. So hit, hit or miss. So you get down into the uh, desert and you can see uh, uh, ostriches and you know other wild animals there driving through there and then between Deridawa and Addis Ababa was a lava bed okay huge thing just and we'd stopped on the side of the road and let the kids climb down in there but it was real um, it was really treacherous because they just had like spikes mm. where the lava cooled. Yeah. And uh, 
then we got into uh, August, and uh, we had a Mennonite uh, couple down there at Dollar. We'd go down there to church on Sunday oh. once a month. And the kids could get uh, little matchbox toys okay. down there. Well, they were so thrilled to go to Addis. They were going to this store, and it would just be full of uh, okay. matchbox. Well, it was actually in the in the bookstore, and they go in there and they see nothing but books and periodicals and all that. And one little shelf had all these matchbox <laughs> toys. <laughs> was there rail service up to Addis? Yes. How long would that take? Take a day. It's longer than thirteen hours. Oh, Ooh. less, less. Less. Mm -hmm. Though, what what was easier, driving or taking the rails up there? I would, well, of course, taking the railroad. Uh, but we took the car because maybe we were going on to Jima to visit or go up north uh -huh. to Esmera. So when we wanted to have transportation in, in Addis Ababa, we drove. The flying, of course, is much easier. Mm -hmm. um, or the train. The train was very reasonably priced. And um, then the airplane came through on Tuesdays and Thursdays. The Tuesday plane carried cargo freight, a little, a little plane. It wasn't DC. DC three. And then the then on Thursday was uh, passengers. Okay. And uh, that was always an exciting trip too. <laughs> Going by plane. How did you adjust to cooking over there? I hired a cook. When we got there, it was customary. When an American family left, the servants came with the house. So when Jimmy Wolf, Wolf moved out, we moved into their house. And this was up at Alabama? Uh-huh. So you had to wait the two months for a house? Two weeks. Two weeks for the house? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because okay, he okay. was going home and Dan was coming in. Okay. And so we inherited their servants. And Dan says, well, we don't need a gardener. So he dismissed the gardener. And then uh, one day passed and no one showed up. Another day passed and nobody showed up. I said, Dan, you hired these people. You find out where they are. And so he asked someone around, and uh, the cook was in, one was in the hospital and one was in jail. Because uh, the servant, the Mamiti's husband, was beaten up on the cook's sister. So the sister intervened, so the sister was arrested from the jail. And the, servant girl, Mamiti, was in, in the hospital. Dan came home and told me that. I said, don't tell your mother. <laughs> I think she would have flown over there and hauled those kids back to the States. So he goes down and he gets some, uh, gets the cook out of jail. And um, I don't know what it was. We didn't get along very well. One day she threw me out of the kitchen, and I said, you're fired. In the meantime, her sister, the Mimiti, was in the hospital. I hired another person to place, take her place. It was an older woman, very statuesque, and I, th I would have thought she was about 50 or so, an older mm -hmm. woman. Anyway, I hired her to be the Mimiti and had the cook. Well, when the cook, I threw her out. The, the woman was sitting over there ironing and watching and listening to all this, okay? So when the cook left, she very quietly said, I cook. I said, why did you tell me? <laughs> she was marvelous. Uh, I didn't have to plan menus. I didn't have to tell her. She had to bake bread every other day. There's no bread shops or anything. Yes. Describe for me your... Uh, house or living quarters? Um, we live up in Parkview Estates. No, 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 no. On a slab. On Ethiopia. And that's what we had on oh. campus. 
Okay. There were houses on a slab. There was an entranceway, living room, dining room, kitchen, and bath, and then three bedrooms. Single level? Huge up, yeah. Single Huge up, yeah. It was great. We lived better because we were not students anymore. We lived in the house. <laughs> Plus, we ate very well. We ate like artichokes and things that our botanists would grow mm -hmm. down at the Arboretum. And he had friends and people sending seeds and seedlings from everywhere, all around the world. Oh. And, you know, it was an experiment for him to see what would grow oh, down girl. there. It was great. And um, we, we'd go down to the Arboretum to get carrots and cabbage and other uh, vegetables that that they grew down there. So we just ate very well. Uh, one thing was, I think, worrisome was that we had to get canned bacon from Denmark <laughs> and and uh, powdered milk. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Something I was uh, just thinking about that this. Upset. Well, in, in in the states, uh, the dry milk is uh, fat free, mm. but the Denmark was whole milk, and the kids never complained about it. They got along real well. Did you have indoor plumbing? Yes. Electricity? Yes. Uh, bathroom situation? What was that like? Just a regular bath. Just regular bathroom. Mm -hmm. Toilet. And all that shower. Okay, just wondering. Just like any American home here, it's still a tub and sink. That's right. <laughs> now, what did you do during your day? Could you describe a typical day for me? Well, after we had our baby there, my job was to get up and feed the baby and bathe the baby. So I had my mamiti to clean the house, I had my cook to do the cooking, and Dan hired the gardener to build the fire. Mm. It was heavenly. I thought, why didn't I wait and have all five of my children here? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I would go down to the arboretum to uh, get uh, vegetables, and if I went to town, my cook would give me a, a shopping list. Mm. And, and they all said, Madame, Madame, you know, we need this, we need that. And uh, so I'd know what to buy for the house. And uh, they observed siesta. And if you didn't get ta downtown Derridawa before 12 o'clock noon, <laughs> you'd have to stay wait. there until 4 o'clock. They go home. They close the shutters, they put on their pajamas, and they go to bed. And then around four, they get up and have tea. And then dinner isn't until nine or 10 or 11. That's the way it was downtown in Deirdawa. And so I've been caught down there when they slam in the shop door in my face. But the main streets came down like this, the V, to the uh, train station. And right across from the train station, the square down there, was a bar. And we'd hang out at the bar. Mm -hmm. And bars are not like the bars here. Um, bars were more like a coffee shop or snack shop or something like that, where you could get uh, soda pop like for the kids. Like a cafe? No, they didn't serve food. Okay. It was just, you know, you could get soda pops and stuff. And, there were two or three of those bars in town where you, know, you could take the family, take the kids, and uh, wait there for the plane or the train or until we got through with their siestas. There was also the Ross Hotel. Okay. Now the old Ross Hotel was um, like a thatched roof and, and a porch all the way around. Kind of like a, I would call it a jungle. <laughs> One of them. Uh, what the guy? Anyway, it was it was like in the Tarzan movies. In the Tarzan movies. Mm. And I remember one night we all went we didn't have a car at first, so we had to hitch a ride with friends and we'd go down and have a movie night. 
or maybe we'd all go downtown and have dinner with with the architect's wife down in the White House is what they call it. The mm. house that the uh, the project rented. Mm. Anyway, there was a lot of socializing and uh, and visiting and having dinner at people's houses. It was really nice because you had servants to take care of, take care of all the details and everything. If you're going to have a big crowd, you could borrow someone else's mamiji or cook mm. or butler or whatever, but you had to buy uniforms for them, which were made locally. Mm. They'd be dressed all in white. So it was real easy to be a hostess for one of those things. Were you kids at school age at that time? Yes. And how did that work? Okay, when we first got there and the information we got, we were going to have to homeschool our children through the Calvert, Calvert system out of, out, of, out of yeah Baltimore. And so, you know, we were ready to go there and order all this stuff. In the meantime, um, we, we had women, some of the women were teachers, and so we started an American school. The kids didn't have to do a correspondence course. Uh, the Americans got together and built a, uh, a cinder block, two-room schoolhouse, which was nice. The kids could just go down two or three houses and be at school. And uh, we had teachers. Um, we had four teachers for the two rooms. And so one woman would, would uh, be the teacher in the morning and a different one in the afternoon. We had the lower grades, of course, and then the high, higher grades. But um, after eighth grade, they had to go to either the American school in Addis Ababa or go to Kenya or someplace else. Mm. That we didn't, uh, our kids didn't get, well, we moved back before yes. Evelyn had to be sent off to school. What were some of the day-to-day -day challenges of running a household over there? Well, I would say supervising the the uh, household help. But the kids ran wild. The students loved the kids, and they would go out the door and do whatever. <laughs> and I purchased a great big um, school bell. And I'd ring that, and I said, you know, when I ring that bell, that means you come home. Mm -hmm. And all the people on campus said, when you hear the Big B's bell, you come home. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. We're, now, did, how did the, how was water supplied to your house? We had tap water, but we had to boil it for at least 20 minutes. A rolling boil. Mm -hmm. Then we had these big crock. Um, filters. filters. About so high and about so big around and you pour your water in there and it had to be filtered. Mm -hmm. Was that well water or was that river or? Where did we get that? Was that well water? Well water. But we had, you know, we had hoses outside so that the gardeners could water the lawn and that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, it's the old joke, you say, don't drink the water. Mm -hmm. Well, the kids playing out would drink from the hose, oh, yes. and they'd eat passion fruit off of the. Some of the people had passion fruit vines, and I don't know, passion fruit was about like that green. And I told them, we said, "Do not eat those; those are poisonous." And they just kind of looked at me because <laughs> they'd been eating those yeah. things since they hit hit town. But it was, you know, it was great. Didn't have to really watch the kids. Mm -hmm. Did did the water have a certain taste to it? Mm -hmm. Okay, because sometimes iron. Would... No. Okay. Filtered, filtered water just was just water. Did the help? Did did their schedule change uh, with the seasons? No, not with the household. Uh, the deal was. They'd come around 7.30 and prepare breakfast. And we were to furnish the, their uniforms and feed them breakfast. 
which was uh, tea and uh, a bun or a roll or toast or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, we were not obligated to feed them lunch, but you know, I'm sure there was uh, things left over from our lunch that they could eat. And then uh, when we hired this woman, we had to have uh, one of the students come up to interpret for us. And Dan was telling, you know, what he expected from her. And he says, I want to have dinner at five. And she kind of raised up and looked down her nose at us. And she said, only peasants eat before eight. Hmm. Dan says, well, I'm a peasant. I want to eat at five. <laughs> but she was a marvelous cook. She could make uh, yeast rolls that would just like Danza's float up. They mm -hmm. were wonderful. And since uh, we were up there on a the hill, there was no shopping or anything else up there. Uh, she had to bake bread every other day because, you know, we had a big family. She could make soup that was out mm -hmm. of this world. Oh, she went to jail. We played tennis. Every day we played tennis. So one of afternoon I'm playing tennis and here comes two policemen walking. And they pass the tennis court and they keep on walking. And so I looked up there and they went up to our house. Then they came back with our cook between them and they came walking. I said, stop! I said, that's my cook! Well, they didn't pay attention to me. <laughs> um, slander, I guess, is, is just not uh, tolerated. Hmm. If I call you an SOB, they can what? come and throw, throw me in jail. Why are you calling me that? I kid. <laughs> but apparently, uh, we had planted pumpkins hmm. so the kids could have pumpkins for Halloween. Halloween. And when I, the kids came together and I said, go get, you know, told Fontai, go get our pumpkins. And they were gone. And she said that Mamiti next door stole them. Oh. So she went over and they got into an altercation. And their Mamiti called the police on my cook. So anyway, we Dan had to go and get her out of jail because she must have called that woman something bad. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, one of the insults was. Theramus. And that meant like a glass. You know, you're just nothing, like um, can't see you or you don't exist or something like that. Mm -hmm. She must have called her a theramus because. <laughs> anyway, we, Dan gets her out of jail, and I said, um, and it was after Halloween. So we had this pumpkin, and, what we were, and I said, What are you going to do with it? And she says, Minestrone. She made the best soups, and she would put she would put pumpkin on all kinds of veggies and cook them up. Yeah. Then she'd strain them and put a pound of butter in. <laughs> it was wonderful, <laughs> but they were always clear and they always had a different flavor. Mm -hmm. What was your favorite dishes or food since we're on that topic? Okay, when Fan Tai finally admitted she could cook if we hired her. We got the student to interpret and she said, well, I didn't mention that I cooked because I cooked for the Europeans downtown and I wasn't sure Americans would eat the same things. I said, Fontai, we love French food. Oh, man. <laughs> and so we just turned her loose. She did everything but, and she made pies. Well, she learned to make pies. Yeah. Well, the thing about the servants, they would, uh, like the gardeners, was, would exchange um, seed. If one guy planted corn, the other guy would have corn. Yes. One had green peppers. Well, our gardener would have green peppers, so they traded around. We even had vegetables in the flower bed. I had to stop that. I said, that's were pretty. Anyway, um, <laughs> the servants did the same thing. The cooks traded recipes. Yes. And things like that. 
and they borrowed sugar and flour just like we would. And um, and the gardeners had to supply, get our wood. And the truck would come periodically and dump some wood down at the wood pile. And then the gardeners would all go down there with their axes and, mm -hmm. and uh, hatchets and whatever, go down there and get wood. But you ask about favorite foods and, and at least our cook could make meatloaf like anybody else. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we, uh, we, we ate pretty much uh, in the same vein that we would have eaten here. Wow. And, uh, but from, you know, local things. Uh, you, you said the, the winter cold the cold climate things? Like oh, well, you couldn't get uh, uh, stone fruit or things that needed to be like apples. fertilized mm -hmm. uh, with cold weather. You couldn't get those there, but otherwise you could get uh, most anything that you would find in, a, in an American mm -hmm. market. Uh, I don't know that, that there was anything particularly exotic okay. mm -hmm. that you would... They, they had their way of preparing yes. things, but we ate chicken and beef and we had pork and, and uh, potatoes and, and noodles and, you know... The first time I bought potatoes, the college was here, and you go out the gate and kind of circle around this uh, lake and out to the road and turn to the right, and there was a church, Christian church, they were orthodox. And right next to that was an open market. Mm. And you go there on market day and you buy things that you need, oil and salt. And, well, I went up to this woman and she had this beautiful basket. It, I, it's with me now, and, and it's the most beautiful thing. And I told her I wanted potatoes, and I've forgotten the word for potato now. But I told her I wanted those potatoes, and she only had about six in the book of this basket. And I told her I wanted potatoes and the basket. And she thought, this woman's nuts. She's going to take my basket, too. <laughs> we buy things that they wonder what in the world we're going to do with it. But those potatoes, I bought those for Fontai. I took them home, and they didn't cook up. They were as hard mm. after an hour and a half in the oven as... Really? Yeah. I don't know what it was with it. Mm. I had never... Since I'm the potato girl, you know, at home, <laughs> going <laughs> under the porch to get it. That's a... <laughs> I, I, I don't know what was wrong with those potatoes. Mm. But they were iron hard, hard, and we didn't eat them. And to throw them out. But that was my first venture off campus. Mm. I went to the open market and got these, got this beautiful basket and a few potatoes. But you could go down there. If they had market day, and I don't know how they got the word out or what, it was never on the same day, mm. but you'd see people coming out of the, over the hill, off the mountains and the valleys, and they're Hundreds of people walking on the road down to open market. So you had to just kind of take your chances. But they would take things. I'd see uh, women with this. They all carried everything on the head. And they would be carrying uh, produce and eggs and stuff. Mm -hmm. And go down to the market and trade. And bottles and cans, they would recycle. They'd use them. And they'd go to the market and sell whatever. And they get that much oil and a little package of salt and walk home. That was all they needed. A little bit of oil, a little bit of salt. And driving down the road to go to Duradawa or, or uh, Harar, I'd see these people walking to market to get their little bit of oil and a little bit of salt. And I said, what are we doing here? Because their 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 wants and needs were so uh, elementary, 
and they could get it. Mm. This woman didn't want a, a shortwave radio or TV yeah. or anything. She wanted that little bit of oil and a little bit of salt. Mm. And uh, some of the villages, there was one village you had to pass going down to Deirdre or down the mountain. And you catch, if you're going down in the morning, you catch the women and girls going down to the spring or creek or whatever. They had to cross the highway to get to their water supply. And they'd fill those jugs up and walk across the street. Mm -hmm. Very graceful. Mm -hmm. And their water bottles would be rounded. I never could understand that. They could put that water bottle and just... Yeah. Did you sample any Ethiopian wines at all? I drank both the beer and the honey mead. The honey mead was a wine made from honey. And the, and the beer was made by just anybody. Mm -hmm. And if they had beer to sell, they'd put a post in their yard and turn an upside down cup. That meant I've got beer to sell. So everyone could make beer. Was that tallow or? Tallow. Then they had the white lightning. Mm. And I could she drink that. Mm -hmm. I, could, I could drink that without any bad side effects. <laughs> Which amazed the Ethiopian people. <laughs> But I loved the food there, mm -hmm. everything. Everything was just wonderful, very tasty. And we could go down as a, we didn't have a car so we would ride with someone else, but we'd go downtown either to the Ross Hotel and have spaghetti or they mm -hmm. had another restaurant they called the Spaghetti Palace. They were uh, ran by uh, Italians mm -hmm. and their, their uh, spaghetti was excellent. Mm -hmm. Now if you go to the Ross Hotel, you would have your salad, your fish dish, or soup and fish dish, and then your entree. And you couldn't stop them anywhere around there. <laughs> you got all four courses yes. whether you wanted them or not. And uh, you always got pasta. Oh, that's right. You always got pasta. Always get spaghetti. Uh, but if I took the kids downtown and. Uh, we happened to get there too late to go shopping. We could go to the Ross Hotel and we could order an egg sandwich. Mm. And their egg sandwiches are, the bread would be this big. I could order one egg sandwich for all of us. Mm. And they made uh, their own potato chips, oh. which were fried in peanut oil. Oh, that's peanut oil. Tasty. It would. They were just excellent potato chips. You can't get potato chips here in the States unless you do it yourself. And you need peanut mm -hmm. oil to do that. Uh, peanut oil was... Uh, we had a spaghetti factory and a peanut uh, oil guy who did the oil just right there on the way to Harar. Harar was about 24 miles away. But on the way to Harar, we could stop and get spaghetti or... Or peanut oil and we'd buy it by the jug I mean like a big gallon mm. bucket or something but it was excellent and it just made everything really you know full of flavor yes. you're making me hungry why didn't I bring up the food <laughs> <laughs> should have waited till yeah, later huh? yeah. um, I have a letter here okay uh, Fran Holland was the wife of the head of the department and she and some of the women got together and prepared this letter for me to tell me what I would need. And uh, I remember her telling, or someone telling us in that letter, not to bring anything, any heirlooms or anything like that. Anything, because things would get broken and stolen and they said, don't bother with that kind of stuff. But do bring plenty of trays and lots of things for entertaining because we entertained a lot. Mm. Uh, we had uh, uh, Indira uh, Gandhi. Gandhi come to tea in Alamaya. Yeah. We, we had um, mm. the DNA guy, Crook, and uh, we have Watson. Watson. Oh, Watson and Crook. Yeah. Both of them or just? Just one of them. Okay. And... Um, Toynbee. Toynbee came and we celebrated his 83rd birthday on campus. 
and uh, trying to think some other people. We have heads of states. All kinds of neat people come mm -hmm. to the campus. We were, oh, the uh, Gregory, was that his last name? The guy who was very heavily into civil rights and all that. Oh, Dick Gregory? Mm hmm okay. He came, and he married an African woman, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just amazing. We just were... Oh, Dick Gregory, wasn't it? Yeah, Dick Gregory. Okay. He was a comedian first, then he became involved with the civil rights movement. Yeah. And let's see. And then she says, um, she's telling us that we quite possibly would have to be in Deridawa until the other people left uh -huh. for states. And then the president, Dr. Kendall, would assign us our house. And she thought we would have an old three-bedroom house uh, because of the size of your family. All the houses are American style, built with native stone, and wrench style. The furniture is European. A lot of the furniture was uh, locally made, but yes. we had some very nice uh, Danish or uh, Swedish uh, uh, furniture. It was really nice. And she tells me what colors the um, draperies are, things like that. Now, the air freight would come sooner. So they said, put in things that you're going to need right away, your sheets and towels and, mm -hmm. and some cooking pots. Because the air, air or the sea freight would come whenever. Mm -hmm. It could take months for us to get our sea freight. It took almost a year for us to get our car. We ordered it from Germany. We asked for a blue station wagon with American specifications, and we got a yellow uh, station wagon with a luggage rack and no American specifications. <laughs> they it came to the port, and they let us know that our car had arrived at Djibouti, but it wasn't offloaded. It went on down to Kenya. Yes. So. Oh, that kind of things happen all the time. You just had to go with the flow, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, they told us to bring an old-fashioned ringer-type washing machine. And the gardener did the washing. Mm -hmm. But the mamiti did, you know, hung them up and brought them in and folded them. They also told us to bring an old-fashioned uh, pusher lawnmower. And uh, there was no ready-made clothes except shoes. I got some cheap shoes from uh, India or someplace. Mm. But if you wanted something, you had to go down to the Magala, which was the uh, marketplace. And the Asian Indians were the tailors. And you go to them and you'd order what you wanted and get measurements and give them specifics and they yeah. make your suits. Yeah, For the boys at Easter time, I think Walt, Robert must have been in first grade. Mm -hmm. Then Walter's two years older than him and then Dan's two years older than Walter. We took them down to the Magala and this tailor measured them. And we had Easter suits made for them. And so with them, where they were done, they let us know, we went down, and they tried the suits on, they were perfect. Hmm. But they didn't have enough fa fabric to make the pants to match Robert's. So two boys had the suits, and Robert had the jacket and different color pants. But they were perfectly, hmm. perfect size. Uh, and the Magala, had beautiful furniture from India, uh, safari stuff mm -hmm. and brilliant. You can't find anything like it in the States, just beautiful material. Did you have the opportunity to bring any, bring any of that back? I have some sh uh, Shama dresses, I have three, and that those came from India. Mine have a band about that wide, and 
since I've been in the States and have gone to dinners and what mm -hmm. style shows, and some of them have borders this big, huge. Mm -hmm. They're beautiful, but they're not like we had. And the Shama was a white linen dress. It looked like cheesecloth to me. <laughs> Homespun, white dress with this border and a shawl to match. And there was mm -hmm. a certain way you draped that shawl around you. Yes. And uh, I usually had to have my maid or someone help me wrap myself. Thank you. Uh, Dan talked about that wedding we went to where we had to sip that glass of wa uh, yeah. whiskey. At that wedding, it was just like we had just gone to Ethiopia. We were still so wet behind the ears. That's the first time I had water in Jera. I love this stuff. And uh, they set us at the head table. So we were really honored. And then with this whiskey thing and all, they gave us, we had two full dinners. Yes, you told them about And that. our student kept saying, well, just keep nibbling. You, you mustn't in, insult the host yes. by not eating. So we kind of had to nibble and sip at that whiskey. <laughs> but uh, about halfway through the dinner, they were coming around with a uh, teapot and people filling their cups. And I thought it was, I said, I think I'll have some of that spiced tea. Well, it wasn't spiced tea, it was their, their, their beer. <laughs> <laughs> so beer and the oh. whiskey. Oh, man. But the, the hostess came up and she said, um, you don't have a shaman. I said, no, we just got into the country and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. She said, I'll get you one. I'm going to Addis Ababa. And a couple of weeks later, I'm going down to Deirdala, the 45 kilometers. And the bus is run about every 15 minutes. Of this big bus, honk, honk, honk. <laughs> and I stopped, and she jumped out. Handed me this package <laughs> through the window, and the bus went on, and I went on. It was shampoo material for my dress. Mm. She didn't want me ever go to anything else to celebrate without a shama dress. But the men had this shama too. They weren't bordered, but all the men would have this shama mm. around them. And I've seen them put that shama over their head and lie down and take a nap anywhere, on the floor, in the yards, in the fields. Mm. They were really handy, and they were warm. If it was chilly, you could wrap up in a shama. It was great. Now, you had a one child over there? We had all of the all. Uh, no. Yeah, my like new baby. Birth. Yeah. She was born at that French rest. Uh, uh, the, okay. The Ethiopian culture is the high ups and rich and... Uh, noble, nobility, did nothing with their hands. Women didn't sew or do anything. Mm -hmm. That showed how wealthy you were. You didn't have, you had all these servants to do everything for you. Then the, the next people would be the uh, bureaucrats. Okay. And the, then the farmers were the lowest class, and the tailors or merchants were right next to the bottom. Mm -hmm. So when you went to the Magala, the only thing that Ethiopians would sell are, are uh, vegetables and produce that they've grown. And then all the tailors were uh, Asian, Indian, the fabric mm -hmm. was from India. Um, and there was the Magala on one side of the river and the European town on the other side. And there was a guy, and you know, like you'd come down to the train track. That was kind of the main drag. There was the, the cheese merchant and he was Greek. Phyllis was his last name. Across the street from him was a hotel and a shop that was about the size of this room, this, mm -hmm. like a nice size closet. And that was one of the guys, Giorgio's, he sold everything. I mean, that stuff was 
clear to the mm -hmm. ceiling. And he'd get cheap stuff from China, India, wherever. Yeah, but what's this got to do with having a baby? <laughs> That's what I was asking about. Okay. <laughs> when Bill Abbott came to see us, and Dan told him I was pregnant and didn't face Bill at all, they sent us off to Ethiopia. And uh, we got there in June. And anyone leaving or arriving, staff of the of Alamaya, everybody would go down to the airport. So we arrived, everybody came. Mm -hmm. And if someone was leaving, everyone would go down to the airport. We went to the airport a lot. Anyway, I was so pregnant and people were getting ready to go to, on home leave. Mm -hmm. The deal was you could go two years and then yep. you, you had to go to home leave. You had to. And uh, so a bunch of the staff were going off as we were arriving. So they thought I'd have that baby before they came back. But when I came back, they came back, I was still pregnant. <laughs> and uh, we lived so high up on the mountain, and I delivered the boys so fast. Dan was worried we'd never make it to the hospital. Mm. And so I said, well, we'll get the, the uh, um, veterinarian. I asked Tony if he would deliver the baby. Mm. He said, no. He said, I'll be the one in the car speeding you downtown. I'm not going to deliver a baby. <laughs> well, this went on and on and just looked like I was never going to have this baby. Uh, so we moved back downtown mm -hmm. so I could be near the hospital. We moved back to the White House okay. upstairs <clears throat> and waited for the baby and waited for the baby. And at night we'd go downstairs to our friend's house and have dinner and everyone would sit around and walk, look at me, wait for me to have that baby. <laughs> <laughs> so one night I'd go in the bathroom and there's the biggest rat I've ever seen. I mean, huge rat. And I start screaming and screaming oh. and Dan comes running because he thought, oh boy, we're going to have this baby. I said, it's a rat. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, everyone's standing there watching over me. The uh, uh, architect's wife decided to go to the movies, mm -hmm. and women don't go in place alone. So she had her gardener go with her. It was right next door. Yes. Go to the movies that night. Dan had gone up further up on the mountain to get the uh, uh, Mennonite doctor to come down and check on me and see everything was okay and see if he could deliver that baby. So the night I started having labor, there isn't anyone. No one, no one's there. <laughs> I, I don't even remember now how I got to the hospital. But anyway, everybody was gone and uh, got to the hospital and a uh, very, very nice uh, doctor. He examined me first and then we had a two-room hut. Mm -hmm. uh, one room was my bedroom and the other room was the delivery room. So when I finally get to the last stages, Dan has to carry me into the other room. And he made remarks about how heavy I was or something. <laughs> you should but, have been like, hey, it's your kid. <laughs> <laughs> it's all your fault. I didn't think about it. But he got me into the delivery room, and I didn't see the doctor. I had already delivered the baby by the time he, the mm. French doctor came. And I don't speak French. He doesn't speak English. The only thing he said, magnifique. And I said, I know that word. <laughs> but Mary, uh, Charlotte Louise was born. Charlotte, I named her after my mother, and Louise from a very dear friend of ours. And uh, she was a beautiful baby. Mm. Then we had to write, she does not have a birth certificate. We wrote to the um, Amer American Embassy, and they had a letter. It's just a letter. It says, you know, has a letterhead and everything to attest to the fact that we had a baby, and her name was Charlotte Louise. Mm. 
and she uses that has to use that you know, for her oh, wow. uh, her social security yeah. and everything she wants to do. She has to haul that letter with her. And I had it laminated because it was the only proof we had yes. that she was born. Anyway, we walked into the what's going to be my hotel or hospital bed. There's nothing in there. There's a, a stone or a steel bed in, with it. You uh -huh. can see the springs and everything. And that's it. And so we had to bring everything. Huh. Sheets. Pillows, pillowcases, towels, and and all the baby things, because they did not furnish or didn't have anything. And when we finally were able to go home, uh, they had, the department had a, a station wagon. So with Dan and the head the station wagon, we packed those cars full of the stuff that I had to take mm -hmm. to the hospital with me to take me back up to uh, to the house. Now, your children, uh, did did they adapt quite well to the culture? It's just like, you know, Danny said, we're not in Michigan. They just figured that's what it is, mm -hmm. and they, they didn't even see the difference, which was amazing mm -hmm. to me. Did they learn the language? Um, what they needed to know. Um, I know the neighbor kid used to go behind to the village back there to the uh, uh, farmers and all around, and he could speak very well or pretty good. But I think our kids used uh, what they needed to tell the servants what they wanted mm -hmm. and tell them what to do or something like that. Did they? Who did they hang out with? Did they hang out with American kids? Did they hang out with Ethiopian kids? At the beginning. We only had American students in our American school, but later on we had uh, uh, some of the Ethiopian uh, faculty had children, and they were they'd go to the American school. When the married Ethiopian faculty came on campus, all the kids just played together and had a good time. And you said uh, you celebrated both. Ethiopian traditions and American traditions, mm -hmm. and your kids partake in both of them just mm -hmm. fine. Or mm -hmm. okay. there was um, a celebration in Harar, which was uh, maskal. Maskal means gold, and it had some religious significance. To um, it was a Christian um, celebration. And I should remember this, but they would sing and dance and put, would build a, build, a big build a big bonfire. And some of them would have um, torches, and so they dance around, and at the right time, they throw the torch, and the thing mm -hmm. would burn. And uh, I read that just recently, and I just can't remember what uh, all the details were. Um, I had to go to Addis Ababa several times. Uh, I had back trouble once, and uh, I flew up there. The, mm -hmm. the uh, um, the I can't even think of the word. The project would send us. We're responsible for our uh, medical needs. And so uh, they would get me a ticket, and I would fly up to Addis. Um, I had back trouble once, and uh, there was a British doctor. And they'd have a MD, and then they'd have a Mister. Mister was higher than yes. And so he was Doctor, Mister, whatever. <laughs> Anyway, he told Dan, he said, if my wife was hurting in the back, I would want to find out what it is. It turned out to be, I have a deformed kidney. Mm -hmm. So the baby okay, uh, did an x-ray and all that, got that straightened out. And then Dan had, uh, you had hernia operation? And Dr. Mister, whoever did him too, he was a really neat guy. And then... 
I had a hysterectomy. Mm. And I went to a missionary doctor. They were Seventh Day Adventists. They don't eat meat. Yes. They don't drink coffee. Mm -hmm. Well, I had my hysterectomy at their hospital. And uh, Americans kind of took care of yes. Americans. And so there was a, an American couple who had a ran the school for the deaf. And uh, at night, when they closed up the hospital, you know, they just locked up everything. And so you couldn't get in or get out. So anyway, they came late one night and they threw rocks at my window and I opened it up and they said, Janice, you need anything? I said, bring me meat. <laughs> 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 I wanted them to bring me coffee too, but I didn't say that. So later on, they had gone you to. Thought one by someone. Yeah. The house. <laughs> they bought me a Chinese dinner. Mm. They're beautiful Chinese uh, restaurants in town. So they went and got me Chinese stuff and threw it through the window at me. <laughs> I appreciated that. From the sounds of it, it seems like Ethiopia was. A highly multicultured. Yes. Which, yes. Which for yes. me being not knowing nothing about the co the co country, that seems surprising. I don't know. Okay, our hairdresser was Marika. She was Greek. She was born in Greece. Grew up, or she was born in Ethiopia. Grew up in Ethiopia, and she had her beauty shop. There were other Greeks. And Italians who were second generation in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. The French ran the, uh, the railroad. The Italians uh, did mechanical things, had the uh, garages, and we had an Italian working on the, in the physical plant. He was an electrician and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and the Japanese came in and we're working with the cotton factory. Alright. And like I say, the Indians and the Armenians and the Greeks, Italians had the shops. Mm. And uh, I never had a bad meal in, a, in a <sighs> Ethiopia. Everywhere we went, there were beautiful French restaurants, Italian mm. restaurants. Uh, and I love Ethiopian food. Mm -hmm. How often would you write back home? <sighs> Maybe once a month. And did you... I know some people recorded into recording devices. You didn't do that? <laughs> All right. Um, our mail, we could, we had APO privileges, mm -hmm. and we could get um, postal. We could get some, uh, we could get mail, and if we, things were sent to us, it couldn't be bigger than a shoebox. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was an AP, there was a, a store in the United States who specialized in sending overseas. Mm -hmm things and they had a huge catalog you could order anything out of it and uh, as long as it wasn't bigger than a shoebox mm -hmm. or it could be sent to Daredevil uh, post office yes. which would take forever because it would have to be go through customs and everything and uh, I did order a pillow from JC Penney and they poked that thing down in the shoebox <laughs> when I opened it it just kind of exploded <laughs> And the thing, that, one of the things that uh, was kind of a hassle, uh, if we ordered things from the states, it would take months. Mm -hmm. And I had ordered all the boys' shoes, and they didn't come, and didn't come, and didn't come. And they had the Christmas program, and Walter had to stand in front of everyone on that stage. His poem about my new shoes and his toes are hanging out. <laughs> that was embarrassing. Um, so we had to plan ahead. Yes. As soon as we got one um, 
holiday over, you had to quick order. Well, we'd order for school stuff, and then be sure right after with that you ordered your Christmas Christmas stuff. So that would come. And after Easter. And then Easter and that way. Mm -hmm. And I wrote to my mother once, and I said, please send me fly swatters. <laughs> she never did. She could not believe that you couldn't buy fly swatters in the whole country. Mm. She did send a shoebox full of some toys once. Did you guys ever fill out an absentee ballot? Did you vote? I noticed that you voted. You have your I voted sticker on. Did you vote? Yeah. Did we vote. We voted absentee, didn't we? I don't really recall voting. Okay. Uh, it's on there. Yeah, you got your. Oh, we voted okay. yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> huh. <laughs> All, right. All right. I was just curious. Um. Now, yesterday or Monday, you stated that your time over there was like a fairy tale. And I wanted you to elaborate on that statement. Everything was so idealistic. We had a beautiful home. We had a full staff who could take care of us. Um, I could go down, always have a tennis partner, or I could go downtown and get my hair fixed and you know, spend time during their siesta going to the Ross Hotel or to the bar and getting a cold drink. And every now and then, I would have to stop and tell myself, this isn't real. You know, everything's just so wonderful. And it's just not real. You know, one of these days, we're going to have to go back to the real world. But uh, it was really, really a nice uh, time for us and the kids. And... Um, our youngest son said, uh, let's go back to Ethiopia. Ethiopia, it's funner there. <laughs> and the kids uh, did say that their cultural shock was coming home. Mm. My cultural shock was coming home. Mm. Um, like what was hard to get used to? Like what made it difficult? Well, for instance, going to the doctor and sitting in the waiting room, everyone spoke English in the States. Mm -hmm. In Ethiopia, you would go and there'd be Armenians, Italians, Greek, you know, people that you couldn't really converse with because you didn't know the language. Mm -hmm. That was different. And the running around, everyone seemed to be on high speed and traffic and crowds and all that. Um, There's, no siesta. There's yeah. no siesta. There's no siesta. You know, you know, manana. Mm -hmm. That's how Ethiopia was. If you don't do it today, is she nugga? Tomorrow, tomorrow's good enough. You just didn't rush around doing things. It was just a life of luxury. We'd go up, either drive or fly up to Addis and go to the uh, fancy. Uh, restaurants and do some shopping and it just I just don't have anything negative to say about it. It was just a very pleasant, wonderful experience for all of us. Have you maintained uh, friendships with the people that you met over there? Oh yeah. Both Ethiopian and Americans? Yes. Are you we, still close to them? Yes. One Ethiopian, he was in the dairy department. And I don't know why, he just kind of latched on to us. And he was like, he was family. He could come to our house any time, night or day. Um, we could call on him. I don't know why, one time he was driving me around and, to show me Wonderfush. He lives in Washington, D.C. now. His wife works for the city of Washington, D.C. And... Um, I'm not sure what he's doing. He did get his degree in, in dairy, but uh, when the American Indian uh, Museum opened, we flew out mm. and stayed with him. 
but he's always calling and writing for us to come and see him. And we're going to do that here one of these days. <laughs> but he was just family, just very close. What about, did you, I know, I know, did you guys didn't come back to Stillwater, right? So where, where yeah. did you, you went to College Park? Yeah. And University of Maryland. I don't, did you, when you were at the University of Maryland, did you, was there Ethiopians on campus? Well, uh, yes. As a matter of fact, the first class that I taught, uh, oh, when I got to, to Maryland, uh, I got the class role, and here was an Ethiopian name. Mm. And uh, <laughs> so uh, it's customary. I uh, was, called the role and checked it, and, and you know, begin to try to associate a name with a person and that sort of thing. And so when I got to him, I just said, uh, uh, I, I said his name, and then I said, Tenestine, you never know. And <laughs> his eyes got big. <laughs> <laughs> Tenestaline is hello. Mm. Yeah. And uh, Tenestaline, and then you'd say, and how Dimana, are you? Yeah. And Dimanalu. Yeah. And Dimanalu, and they'd answer. Uh, uh, yeah, Dana, I'm fine. Um, that reminded me of another thing. We were, okay. we were told all the males, you must address them as Mr. And their word for Mr. is Otto. So we had a chemistry and mathematics guy come to Elmai as a staff member. And, you know, everyone was introduced, mm -hmm. this is Otto so-and-so, this is Otto so-and-so. This is uh, Joe Landry. He's a man that a lot of people here named Otto. <laughs> <laughs> but we were told things we shouldn't do or should do, mm -hmm. uh, but to always be respectful and to not to ask personal questions. Mm. You say, Ternesteline and Demonalu, and he says he's fine. Then you're supposed to ask about their mother and their father and their kids and the weather and everything. Broad. Yes but never personal questions. Uh, one of the American women was the uh, manager of the cafeteria, student cafeteria, and I had gone down to Daredawa with her several times because she bought her sugar and her flour locally. And, uh, oh she lost the train of thought. Anyway, went downtown with her to get things. And, um, you, oh, I know what it was. We went to the coffee. We went to the coffee merchant. Our coffee there. We sat down. We had coffee, and we visited. I don't know how long. Mm. You never go in and say, "I want a pound of this and leave." Yes. You never do that. You sit down and you have tea or something. When I went to the hairdresser, she always offered me coffee and cake or something. You know, a take of something. But you just didn't go. Wham! This is mm. my business and leave. Mm -hmm. Which was interesting for me to sit there and sip coffee and chew the fat a little bit. Now, is there anything, I know you got a folder of stuff, materials here that we haven't discussed that you'd like to share with us since you were here? This letter, uh, unfortunately, this is the rough draft. Mm -hmm. And uh, I became acquainted with Mama Sarah. Her son was our purchasing agent on campus, was staff member. And his mother had TB, and he brought her up to Harar to the hospital for her recovery, and so he could visit her as often as he wanted. And um, she was there during Christmas, and I um, started visiting her. And so for Christmas, they have what they call um, Gunna. Mm -hmm. Christmas is Gunna. Okay. And they have a special bread that they bake, a yeast bread, and they put uh, boiled eggs in. 
You're going to make me hungry again. I <laughs> <laughs> it was delicious. Anyway, I took her uh, gun up bread. She thought that was amazing. And um, I'm writing her and saying, I often think of you. And I wanted to learn Amharic and Tigree so I could visit with her. And I told her, I know she has lots of stories about her family and the country and whatever, as she was growing up that I wanted to know. And I told her, I'm in America now and I have no household help. I have lots of machines, the dishwasher and the automatic uh, washer and the dryer. Still, I have a lot to do. And I said, four years we were in Ethiopia will be remembered forever and ever. All the wonderful friends we had there. Um, and the country was beautiful. We had traveled around the world and there's no country that is anything like Ethiopia. The mountains in Ethiopia are in Europe and the deserts and mountains and forests just don't compare. I loved it there so much. Um, I hope that we will be able to visit you after the children finish school in maybe 10 or 12 years. But we all talk about going back. All of us have, the kids and, I, and us. And I said, I hope this letter finds you and your family well. Please give my regards to all of them. Our house is full of Ethiopian items, mats, Baskets, uh, what's this, injera baskets, rugs, pictures, two gold stools, water pots, watch pots. I try to bring all of Ethiopia back with me. I also brought some Doro Wat spices, but I haven't made any yet. Now, Doro Wat was very special very special occasion. You made chicken wok, that's daughter wok, and you put chicken, uh, put boiled eggs in that, in the wok. Ooh, making myself hungry. <laughs> um, I said, I'm saving my Dora wok spices, and I haven't made it yet, not even for Christmas. We show our pictures of Ethiopia to international groups of the University of Maryland. And uh, people enjoy them as we tell them about Ethiopia and how beautiful it is. And this is when we were in Maryland. Mm -hmm. I say, uh, um, like I said, one of the cultural shots was that everyone busy job, uh, driving and shopping and there were just people and there were six lanes of highway or roads. And I told it was like Church Churchill Drive in Ethiopia. Now in Addis Ababa, the uh, Churchill Drive was the main. Mm -hmm. You look up in the hill and there's the big uh, town hall and all that up the hill and that's the most travel road in Addis Ababa because it's the main I said it's like Churchill Drive in Addis at the rush hour. But she was my mama Sarah. Um, I visited with her while she was recovering and then she went to Addis Ababa to uh, stay with her daughter and I went to see them. I flew up, took a taxi, and there's no streets, no street names, okay? Mm -hmm. You just say left, right, left, right, and I knew how to say that in Ethiopia. So, our M.M. Herrick drove up, I found the right house. <laughs> it was dusk, it was dark. And I knocked on the door, and Mama Sarah just, oh my gosh! She said, how did you get here? How did you tell the taxi driver? <laughs> well, she did the same thing herself. She doesn't speak any English. She flew from Addis Ababa 
to New York City and went to see her nephew. And he said, how in the world did you tell the taxi cab driver how to find me? So we drove up to uh, Kalamazoo where her son was and visited her mm. here in the States. What's the overall impact of the experience? What's that impact on your life been? <sighs> I guess I'm like Dan. I was hoping that we would be of uh, some impact uh, uh, positive impact on all the people we knew and the, the mission of the OSU with establishing Alamaya. And it's just treasured memories. And um, having the baby there And uh, we did have a lot of interaction with this with the you know, students. We'd celebrate their festivals, and like Dan said, we had to have fast cookies that had no animal product in it. Our uh, cook fasted for eight weeks. Mm. By the end of that, they were just dragging. Oh yeah, not eating for that long, and they had so many fast days I couldn't even count them. But I was just hoping that we had made an impact, even the, the uh, uh, stay-at-home moms and the American staff and all. I just hope that maybe they would remember us uh, fondly and that we'd have try to help them out with their development. Uh, here's another letter that I have. Um, the hospitals are Russian, Czech. British or some U.S. Min, uh, missionaries. So they, you talk about an international. Yes. Well, Ethiopia was a na neutral company, uh, com country. Country between the during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So just you know, everybody there was a Chinese and the Russians and Russians had a a technical school in mm -hmm. the northern province. But, uh, Do you miss it? Yes. Even to this day? Yes. You go back in a heartbeat? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I would. Would your children go back? Oh, yes. Have you guys traveled outside the U.S. since? Uh, we went, w this was for my anniversary. It was a wish I'd had all my life to go all across Canada on the train. Mm. We left Halifax and took the train to Victoria. Oh wow! Four days, four nights, and the price of the, the all the food was in the price of the ticket, and they had gourmet meals, linen tablecloths, and mm -hmm. the whole thing. And then just about last year, we went to Cozumel. Our son married a British girl, and she has a beauty shop on this little island in Mexico. Oh, nice. So we flew down to see her. But a wonderful experience. Nothing like to Europe or anything like that? Uh, we were... Well, we went to our son's wedding in England. And we went to Sweden to see yeah, our friends uh, there. Yeah, but, um, and I've worked in Morocco. Mm. Oh, That's I visited right. Morocco also. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, Do you want to briefly, and briefly share about your Moroccan experience? Uh, well, again, that, that was a project uh, very similar to the one in uh, Alamaya. Uh, it was an institution building effort uh, to establish a, uh, an experiment station mm -hmm. for dry land agriculture in uh, Morocco. Um, my role in that project was uh, uh, the stateside coordinator. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was responsible for recruiting uh, technical assistants to go to, uh, to um, Morocco. Uh, Morocco. Mm -hmm. uh, I was um, supervising the, um, the graduate training program for the Moroccans that would come to the States for study, as well as the training of uh, uh, technicians and, and other professional staff associated with the station. Uh, we had a very large procurement program uh, for the acquisition of uh, uh, materials and structures and mm -hmm. supplies and so on. Uh, uh, Who was in the consortium? Well, I'm, I'm getting to that. Okay. <laughs> but that was the basic function of our office. Now, the project was uh, under contract to a five consortium uh, or five university consortium of which OSU was a member. Okay. Uh, Nebraska happened to be the lead institution for which the you consortium. Were, you were at UNL at the time? I was at the UNL at the time. And uh, so the, the project began back in the early 1980s and wound up uh, the mid 1990s. And uh, I was with the project for about 12, uh, 10 years oh, wow. or so. Um, uh, again, I think the great success of, of that effort uh, by the consortium, OS, and S, OSU in particular, uh, was that we did leave behind uh, a, a well-trained, uh, and functional uh, faculty and yes. staff. Uh, and the, the station that was established and so forth it, it still functions uh, uh, and is doing a, a good job to deal with uh, the arid conditions mm -hmm. in the central part of, of Morocco. So, so that was in a nutshell, let's... So you've been part of two successful international... Yes. ...extension services, I would say. Well, uh, so institution building... Yes, yes. ...activities, yes. So you've, you personally fulfilled the land-grant mission? Yes. <laughs> right? Am I right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's a good way to, to, to put it. All right. Uh, so, all right, let's just wrap this up here. So you were at the University of Maryland from 1966 until uh, 78. Okay, and then 78 to 95. 95. I was at the University of Nebraska. Okay, and then you retired in 95. Yes. And you came home. Yeah. What would you call came Stillwater? To Stillwater? Would yeah. you call Stillwater home? Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, all right, all right, just fill that yeah. in. Now, let's get back to you for a little, briefly. All right. Now, uh, what was your reaction of coming back to Stillwater? Well, I was dragging my feet because I own this farm, and all my life I dreamed of having, you know, living on this farm. And Dan says, I'm not going to live on a farm. And I said, well, I'm not going to live in Walters. <laughs> and if I die, don't you bury me in Walters. <laughs> and so we were looking for a place. We went out to New Mexico. He inherited a farm, which was totally worthless. We couldn't live there. There's no water. Mm -hmm. So in our hunt, I finally suggested uh, Stillwater and that then loved mm -hmm. that because mm -hmm. some of the people he worked with in Ethiopia and some of the people in the Moroccan project are here in Stillwater. Mm -hmm. So he had, you know, we had new people was the uh, unknown uh, area. So Stillwater still has some of its old um, charm. charm, 
but then it's grown out that way that I'm not familiar yeah, with. Because right. when we were here, uh, Perkins Road was the end of Stillwater. Yep. That road wasn't even paved when we were here. Mm -hmm. So we never ventured out there. And the swimming pool was behind that big um, feed, mill. feed mill. So a lot of it's changed, but we still have our friends who are here and we socialize with them. Mm -hmm. And we still have our church, First Methodist. Yes. It's our church home. Now, is there anything you would like to add? Well, one thing I didn't mention was, let me go back. Living near Fort Sill, it's an artillery uh, school. Mm -hmm. And we hear thunder all the time when they're shooting, you know, using, practicing their cannons. And um, we were in Ethiopia, and there was a mountain there, it looked like Mount Scott from our living room, and I'd hear this far off thunder. Yes. And didn't think anything of it. We came home on home leave, and we went back, and one of the preachers and his wife came by. And I kept replacing the, the light bulb in the hallway. I mean, they wouldn't last very long. I was always buying new ones and putting new ones in. And while we were saying goodbye, I said, do you mind screwing in this new light bulb? And he put his hand on it and it came off. And he tightened it. He says, oh, you must have been having uh, a lot of earthquakes. And see, I didn't know anything about earthquakes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we were, shook, we were shaken about three times while I was there. Mm. The chandelier kind of went like that. But that was our second tour that I found out there were earthquakes. <laughs> Which we don't have here. Uh, you can't yeah. get them. You can get them in Oklahoma. Oh yeah, <laughs> I know, but they don't seem like a threat. Like mm -hmm. and he said, that kind of that was kind of scary. Mm -hmm. If um, we'd had one that did some damage, I didn't know if you know, we could fly out or take the train mm -hmm. or just what would happen. It was a little worrisome, but still doesn't take away the charm of that country. All right, one last question. In the view of things, how would you like to be remembered, both of you? You mean Ethiopian-wise or otherwise? Otherwise, and generally, generally speaking. Well, I brought my resume. <laughs> <laughs> I went to school at University of Maryland, and it was a summer course. You take those one-hour courses yeah. you kind of fill in, so I took drama. And one of the first things we did sitting around, uh, the instructor says, turn around and talk to your partner and find out about them, because I'm going to ask you to introduce them. So we went around and I was telling, he's a little Greek guy, telling about all my adventures. And when he came turn, his turn to introduce me, he said, this is Janice Bigby and she's done everything. <laughs> And I feel like, you know, I've, I've done a lot of things. Um, for Native American people, that's why I went to college, to be helpful to my tribe. And um, I had a radio show once uh, with the women uh, in, Ethi or in Nebraska. I was the director of the Indian Center there in Lincoln. It was... Um, active with the state uh, Democratic Party mm. as a, a state uh, delegate mm. and uh, was a Toastmaster. I got my, I think it's Master Toastmaster. Anyway, almost the top, yes. one, one way, uh, one little bit down, step down from that. Um, I organized a Native American consortium that was uh, statewide. In Nebraska? In Nebraska. It was great. People came from everywhere. Everything went off like clockwork. The next year, I thought we'd have more participation and all, but it wasn't as good as the first one. Mm -hmm. 
So you've done everything. So mm -hmm. I think I've done everything. She didn't mention that she's also been a member of the uh, Comanche Business Committee, which is the governing body for the Comanche tribe. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I did that. Yeah. What about you? How would you like to be remembered? Oh, I've never really thought about that. Uh oh. <laughs> Man, I asked the hardest one at that. Yeah, that's right. Um, I, I would can't say uh, yeah. a compassionate leader. And the little British daughter in law. If there's a question come up, she'd say, ask Dan, he knows everything. <laughs> I wished I could, uh, I wished I could recite it, but um, and there's a, a quotation that I keep, and I always had it on the wall of my office uh, from um, Ralph Waldo Emerson. That um, the the world is a wonderful place, and there's a there's a lot to appreciate, and um, there's a, a lot to be accomplished in it. But to have the appreciation of of uh, Small children, mm -hmm. uh, um, to have uh, made the life of one person a little more pleasant, mm -hmm. uh, that to have succeeded. Mm -hmm. I think that was John F. Kennedy's favorite quotes, or one of John F. Kennedy's favorite quotes. I'm sorry? I think that's one of John F. Kennedy's favorite yeah. quotes. Oh, okay. But that, we can look that up yeah. for you, so. Well, I've got it at home. I just, Dan yeah. is a strong leader, and everyone feels like they can approach him and cry on his shoulder. Just everybody. <laughs> we had a little incident in Oklahoma City, and this uh, our uh, granddaughter called Dan. Our uh, son-in-law from North Carolina calls mm -hmm. Dan on uh, em employment advice and otherwise. Mm -hmm. He's just that kind of person that we know he's strong and he will give us good advice. He'll listen and give us good advice. Mm -hmm. Well, I thank both of you for your time the last three days. Um, I've learned a lot. And I appreciate hearing your story, like I said in the letter, and I've learned some, so that's always a good thing. That's good. And I, once again, thank you for your time.